Welcome to The Dark Divide, a podcast that takes a seat, dangles its legs over the edge, and stares into the abyss. This is the story of Melinda Pleskovic. The importance of routine can have crucial elements to it. In many ways, our routine shapes us into the person that we are. For some of us, it's spontaneous, but more often than not, it can be quite predictable. And as our personal routine intersects with others, it's easy to lose sight of what might be unusual or out of the ordinary. If someone else changes plans, or if someone's routine is strangely off, it's up to us to decide whether it's nothing or something. And on the evening of Monday, October 23rd, 2017, Bruce Pleskovic was doing just that. As he sipped his dollar margarita, waiting for his burger to arrive, he texted his wife, Melinda. Hey, we're all at Applebee's. Where are you? Their daughter, Anna, worked as a server there, so it was a place they frequented throughout the week. But something wasn't right. He explained how weird it was to Anna's boyfriend, Jeffrey, sitting across from him. Melinda had texted Bruce a couple hours ago, telling him to meet her at a different restaurant called Brew Kettle. Oddly enough, they'd just been there the night before. But recently, there'd been some stressful situations in the family, and he figured maybe she wanted to meet somewhere to talk. But Melinda didn't show up or respond to him. That's when Anna told him the plan was that they were all meeting at Applebee's during her shift. Jeffrey called him and told him to head over, too. He was doing the same with baby Aurora. During a birthday dinner for Melinda, Anna had announced that she and Jeffrey were expecting, and he moved in shortly before Aurora was born. Bruce and Melinda had two other children as well, Megan, who occasionally came home from college, and Kyle, who was about to graduate high school. It was quite the full house. On top of that, Bruce had just received news that his company was downsizing, and unfortunately he'd be among those to go. Anna and Jeffrey had a wedding around the corner, and as far as Bruce knew, the whole reason they were even out to dinner tonight was to meet with Jeffrey's mother, who was going to pay back some money on his behalf that he owed Melinda. He hadn't been the best groom to be, from what Bruce observed but he just bit his tongue these days and hoped the kid would be a better husband than he was boyfriend or live-in son-in-law. Bruce usually didn't really have much to do with these kinds of things. He left it to the women in the family. But as he sat there waiting for Melinda to respond, he had a weird feeling in his gut. Anna came over to the table with their food orders. She too had been trying to reach her mother to no avail. I'm pretty sure she'll be here soon. She's always running into people she knows, Jeffrey assured Bruce, which was true. It felt like Melinda pretty much knew everybody in Strongsville, Ohio. But by the time their dinner was done and the bill was paid, she still hadn't showed and Bruce was anxious to get going. Anna had a few hours until clock out, so she kissed baby Aurora on the head and the guys headed home. The first thing Bruce and Jeff noticed upon arrival was Melinda's red car in the driveway. Bruce muttered annoyances about how she was here the whole time as they made their way inside. Admittedly, he'd started to get a little worried, but now he was just eager to find out why she hadn't been answering her phone and stood him up twice. Except when he got to the door, it was locked. The front door has two locks, a typical one that opens with a key from the outside, and a deadbolt lock that nobody ever used. Bruce pounded on the door, yelling for Melinda. Eventually, Kyle was able to open it and let them in, and nothing about that was normal. It was only a few steps until the shape of Melinda's body on the kitchen floor would come into sight, with her face down in a pool of blood. It would take Bruce a second to register that the sound he immediately heard after seeing her was his own screaming. Melinda was stiff and cold. Something had happened, but he wasn't sure exactly what. She wasn't responding at all, and when he went to turn her over, he noticed that her back was the texture of chunks. There was blood all over her, hands shaking, He calls 911. Understandably shocked, he doesn't give an address right away. Instead, he tells the dispatcher what happened, and he's angry. Once released, his call would spark empathy in some and suspicion in others. He just isn't your typical upset. The dispatcher has a hard time getting him to pause his ranting and raving in order to collect information, and even by the end, she's gotten little to none. 911, what's the city of your emergency? Strongsville, Ohio. We have people on the way already. What's the address? We're blazing starter. I think someone killed my wife. You think someone killed your wife? Yeah, there, it looks okay, like she has stab wounds on her back. We've had people trying to break sir, into our house sir, all year. Sir, I understand, Steal- sir. I need to ask you questions, okay? Are you there right now? I just got in the door with my new son-in-law. My son was okay, here with her. Sir, what I want you to do is walk outside and stay in the front, okay? You said she's stabbed in the back. 
Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, know, if you don't, I think you can the, start. CPR. I don't think she's. Her face hit the ground and there's blood. There's a but pool of blood. See if she's breathing. No, she is not. Do you think this is a guy that. CPR. No. Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to go outside. Everyone in the house, go outside and wait in the front. Okay. Bailey, who thinks he's standing in the back? Do you see anyone else in the home? My son is here. He has Down syndrome. To bust him. She sent me a text Wait. to meet me at Brew Kettle at 425. I didn't hear from her. I didn't expect this. No, sir, I understand you're upset, but where's Kyle at in the home? Is He's he outside with Jeff, our son-in-law. You know, we've asked people to watch our frickin' area. We've had people attempt to break in just this week. Sir, I, I don't know what's going on in this city, sir, but this is getting done here. I understand you're upset, but can you give me your name, please? No, you, sir, you people drop them. Sir, can you just take a deep breath? Is there any... This whole city's getting freaking taken over. Sir, I understand you're upset, but I need you to stay focused, okay? You don't think you can perform CPR, correct? She's in the go. kitchen. I can't you... believe this. Are We've you... had a break in... All your things were stolen and sir, missing. Where's she at? Are, to the left. She... I, I saw this chair down. You said she's in the kitchen? She is in the kitchen? What was that time Sir? Bob, I, I, I got here. We got home about three minutes ago. You said she's in the kitchen? You saw her. What's your this name? This morning, 7.30 a.m. What's your name? Like I'm her husband. Okay, what's your we, name? We've had people trying to break in our house, all, like, a lot. They flash our cameras. We're getting targeted, and I don't know by who's doing this, but I'm pissed. Oh, do you see the medics there, the police there yet? Everyone's here. Okay, go speak with the police officer. I'm going to disconnect with you, okay? I can't believe this. Could you go speak with the officer that's there? I was trying to text her all the time to go out to eat. We always, it's our usual routine. Sir, do you see the officer there? What's that? Do you see the officers? I have two officers here. Okay, go speak with them. I'll hang up with you. Yeah. But Bruce's call to 911 wasn't the initial call. Jeffrey had also called 911 almost immediately when he heard Bruce start screaming after walking into the house in front of him. He's clearly panicked, but he gets authorities there quickly. And the dispatcher happens to recognize the address, as there had been a call earlier about one of their dogs. Melinda would never have let the dogs get loose outside. Somebody had been there. Southwest, this 911, what's the address of your emergency? Uh, somebody, somebody's been attacked in my house. Somebody's been what? Attacked. Oh, what's the address? I'm home. Uh, for Blazing Star Drive. Blazing Star Drive? They yeah. attacked who? Who was attacked? Uh, Someone get I, uh, my fire. Uh, uh, Mel Pleskovic. Mel Pleskovic was attacked. He was attacked by whom? Do you know? She, she was, no, we, we just came home. She's on the kitchen floor. I, I, took the, I took her son and my daughter outside. Her husband is inside with her now. So the husband attacked her? No, no, no. We just came home. We just came home. You came home and found her injured on the floor? We found her in the kitchen. She's not moving. I, I took the kids and I walked outside. I didn't know. So did she look like she was beaten or what? She, she has blood all around her. I didn't, I didn't look. I just grabbed, I grabbed the child and left. Can you okay. send someone here? I am. I am. Hold on a moment. Don't hang up, sir. Do not hang up. Sir, is there a dog at the house? No, Maybe the dog uh, got yeah. out. Black lab. Did no. she have a black lab? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna send. I'm gonna send medics. Don't hang up. Is she conscious? Do you know? I. I don't know. I, okay. I, hold on. So we have two small kids. Okay. Okay. Outside. Okay. Hold on. I'm gonna get fire going. Hold on a moment. Sir. Hello? Hi. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have the medics and police responding. Okay. All right. I need to get. There's a lot of blood. Okay. Yeah, I only got there, but I, I'm outside. How do you know this woman? Is she? I live here. I live here. She's my fiance's mother. It's your fiance's mother. Okay. Yes. Is she, like, had anybody trying to harm her, harass her, anything like that? I, I, no, no. Okay. Do you have a dog that lives at that house? We, your... we, we, have, we have two. We have two dogs. Okay. Are the dogs there or you don't know? 
I, I don't know. We just walked in the front door. Okay, because we got a phone call from somebody who found a dog that belongs at your residence. That's why I'm thinking the dog's got out, okay? What is your name? He's right here. I have... Okay, who's talking to you right now? He's, uh, her husband. We just came home together. Telling you, is she conscious? She's, she said she has multiple stab wounds, and he's on the phone with somebody else. Okay, she's got multiple stab wounds. That's what he just came out and told me. We hear the ambulance. Okay, they're coming, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. It's okay, sweetie. They think she's got multiple stab wounds. All right. Okay, sir, who's... That's her husband? That's, uh, that's her husband, yes. Okay, do you see any, like, forced entry or anything to the house? I, I'm, I'm outside. The door was locked. The door I, was locked? The, the front door was locked. Okay. We, okay. 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 All right, we, we have help coming, okay? Do you see the squad there yet? Do you see him? I, I see an ambulance. Is that what? Okay. All right. Are you guys all outside right now? I'm outside, inside, I think. I don't know where he is. He, he was running in and out. I don't know what's going on. He was on. running in and out? Okay. I have a male. There's two males there and two children right now. I'm outside by the red truck. Okay. Okay. You didn't see any weapons or anything, correct? Uh, no, I, I barely saw her. I walked in and I, I grabbed you the You saw the blood and, and you ran. Out. Okay. I ran outside and called the police. Okay. Okay. I'm going to stay on the phone with you until officers and the medics are there, okay? All right? All right. Did say if she's, does he think she's alive or he doesn't know? I, I don't know. She said she, she's been sad. That's what he okay. said. He ran and he went he back it. in? He, he ran out and then ran back in? Yeah. Okay. All right. He ran out looking for Was that an officer or the medics? The police are there? Uh, it's police. Okay. Okay. All right, sir. Just wait and talk to the officers. Thanks for your help, okay? You did good, okay? And, uh, and I'm sorry for All the right. circumstances, okay? All right. All right. All right. Bye-bye. All right. All right. Thank you. Melinda was taken to Southwest General Hospital and pronounced dead at 9 p.m. Her autopsy report would conclude that she'd been shot three times and stabbed at least 36. But that would only indicate how and where. Authorities would waste no time in beginning to track down who killed Melinda Pleskovic and why. The morning of Melinda's murder had been like any other morning before it. Bruce woke up for his accountant position at the bank like he had for 26 years. This part of his routine was nearing its end, though. His company was downsizing, and he would be one of the people they were letting go by mid-November. He had some interviews lined up, but to say he was stressed was definitely an understatement. It all just felt a little surreal. Right when he could see some sort of retirement around the bend, his plans were getting shaken up in a way he never prepared for. It had been almost three decades since he'd even interviewed for jobs. The market had expanded and grown. At 52 years old, he was up for jobs against people around his kid's age. Honestly, the part that bothered him the most wasn't even being laid off. It was the fact that he hadn't really liked his job anyway. He should have left years ago. So, on the bright side of things, at least he was getting a chance to start fresh. After his morning shower, he wakes up his son Kyle and also gets him showered as well. Kyle, having both Down syndrome and ADD, requires a lot of care. Besides a few words or repeated sounds... His only son was nonverbal. It had taken Bruce a long time to make peace with what could have been. He'd just turned 18, and it was still admittedly difficult to celebrate that milestone of adulthood, knowing that it didn't mean the same thing for Kyle that it did for his other children. Kyle was his youngest, and it was bittersweet that he would remain young. His oldest, Megan, was 23, and although her teenage room remained as it was, she mostly spent her time at the college dorms. She was athletic and ambitious. He wasn't any less proud of Kyle than he was of his sisters. He just wished that he could wave a magic wand and give his son the life he felt he deserved. Melinda taught the sixth grade, and when she wasn't at school, every minute of her life was pretty much devoted to Kyle. So Bruce loved this shower time with his son. It gave her a break, and it gave them precious bonding time. It was a privilege to be the first person Kyle got to see every day. By the time they come downstairs around 5.45 a.m., Mel's ready and making Kyle his daily bowl of oatmeal. Bruce always heads out to start the car and toss his work bag in before going back to say goodbye to Kyle and Mel. Without fail, she always trades him a cup of coffee for a kiss. 
And that's how Bruce could always find his calm in any storm. Because for all the instances where his life may be stressful and chaotic, there were moments when it was absolutely perfect. If they needed to budget or downsize their house, he knew it didn't matter. When you're married to your best friend, wherever you are is home. Bruce pulled out of the driveway around 5.50, unaware that it would be the last time he'd ever see Melinda alive. Bruce and Melinda's middle child, Anna, also lived at home. During Melinda's birthday dinner in January 2015, Anna had surprised her by announcing that she and her boyfriend, Jeff, were expecting. Understandably, Melinda and Bruce were shocked. They'd been dating for three years, so it wasn't like Jeff was a stranger. They liked the kid. But that was just it. They were kids. This would mean that Anna would be a mom at 19, and Jeff a father at just 20. Regardless, the two were also excited to celebrate the birth of their first grandchild. They knew it wasn't easy, having a full house themselves, and the two of them would just be fresh out of high school. So they invited Jeff to move into the downstairs area of their home, which was built like its own tiny apartment of sorts. That way Anna and Jeff could raise the baby together while they got on their feet financially. Plus Melinda loved having the sounds of a baby in the house again, able to teach them everything she'd learned from raising three of her own. Anna and Jeff welcomed their daughter Aurora into the world on July 3rd, 2016, and the two loved parenthood, especially Anna. She just couldn't get enough of this little mini-me that cooed and giggled so happily. She wasn't fussy, she slept well, and where they expected to be overwhelmed, they actually found themselves thinking maybe they could do this mom and dad thing after all. Jeff proposed to Anna, and the two would begin to plan a wedding for the next year. They also adopted a seventh-month-old boxer pit mix, naming him Moose. Their family tree was in the beginning stages of its story, and even though things weren't perfect, they were shaping out to look like a little content life. They just needed to get themselves financially stable. Jeff had lost his job as an AC repairman shortly after moving in, so they were surviving solely on Anna's wages at Applebee's. But Anna didn't mind being on her feet all day. She loved the customer, she got along well with her co-workers, and the tips weren't bad either. On margarita nights, she could easily pull home a few extra hundred dollars. But things had been starting to get a little stressful. There'd never been any definite time that Jeff and Anna needed to move out, but sometimes it felt like Anna was the only one trying to even make that happen. Jeff was the type who always had an excuse for everything. He was still currently unemployed, but his parents owned property rentals, as did he, which still provided him an income. Yet he and Anna didn't seem to have any meaningful amount of savings put away. When it came to the wedding, he had little to no interest in any of the planning, and right up to the very last few weeks, still hadn't put down any of the payments to secure the venues or other arrangements. The wedding of 161 expected guests had been budgeted out to around $6,500 total. Any time Melinda asked Jeff about the money for the wedding, it was excuses and mishaps, forgotten debit cards, closed banks, flat tires... Jeff always seemed to have both the perfect solution and the worst luck to keep him from carrying it out. An enigma of sorts. A lot of talk without much to show. But he sounded unbothered. He even told Melinda and Bruce that with the help of his rental income and his parents, he'd purchased a home to move into after the wedding. It was currently in foreclosure, and he was just waiting on the keys. Melinda was skeptical. Bruce didn't pay much attention. Honestly, a little disinterested in all the wedding stuff, and much more focused on how he was going to continue to provide for his family. He didn't really know the details of what exactly was going on. He knew something about Jeff's mother meeting them at Applebee's for dinner, because eventually Melinda was the one who had to put a down payment to secure a venue for the wedding. Jeff's mother was going to pay her back. It was actually a big deal. Jeff's parents had never really come around. Time and time again, Melinda and Bruce threw out offers for drinks or dinners, but Jeff, usually the messenger, explained that his parents weren't the socializing type and extremely busy. They didn't really have much interest in their own marriage anymore, let alone double dates. Still, it seemed a little strange, sometimes off-putting, that these people were completely disinterested in occasionally socializing with the parents who were allowing their son to live in their home, rent-free, with their grandchild. On October 28th, the date that had been set for the wedding, the family would hold Melinda's funeral. Instead of joining each other down the aisle to be married, Anna would cry quietly as she held Aurora, and Jeff would serve as a pallbearer for Melinda's casket. It's no secret that the first 48 hours can often provide the most crucial leads in a homicide case, and the Strongsville police wasted no time getting the investigation started. 
Even before a final autopsy was completed for authorities, it was clear that Melinda's murder was one full of extreme rage and violence. Who could have had the opportunity and motive to kill her, and would that person strike again? The entire family comes in for questioning in Anna's first. There's two detectives in the room. Detective Ron Stoltz, who sits at the desk across from her, paper and pen ready to jot down her answers, and Detective Strong, who is observing in the corner, and starts off by explaining to Anna that they were a little unsure if they should do this so quickly, considering everything she's been through, but they figured it would be best to get it over with, and she agrees. Detective Stoltz clarifies everyone's living situation and where she works. Anna sits with her legs crossed and hands resting together on her knees. She comes across more like being in a job interview conversation than an interview following a homicide. Having always been the emotionally reserved type, she'd cried all her tears out in private. The bright fluorescent lights and the chill of the interrogation room were surreal. She welcomed any small talk about Aurora and Margarita Mondays, as it suspended the real reason why she was sitting in that room. Detective Stoltz then asks Anna to describe her routine for the day, which is usually the same. She wakes up whenever Aurora does in the morning, around 9.45, and then spends some time feeding her and getting her dressed. Her shift starts around 10.30 a.m., and she usually leaves around 10.15. The purpose of Anna's interview isn't for police to clear her alibi, because Anna was at Applebee's all day. Instead, it's to get a clear picture of the household dynamics. Even though Bruce had told the 911 dispatcher that they'd been dealing with disturbances and break-in attempts, Authorities knew that your average B&E in Strongsville, Ohio, didn't usually occur in broad daylight with the vehicles in the driveway, and it certainly didn't end up with a victim being murdered with such brutal force. Whoever killed Melinda had been very angry and most likely knew her. Police were particularly interested in Kyle, Jeff, and Bruce. Anna tells the detective that Jeff moved in shortly after she got pregnant, around the end of 2015. They had originally planned to move into one of his rental homes, but apparently it had been broken into, so Bruce and Melinda decided it was safest for them to be downstairs. Anna doesn't know how much Jeff makes off of his rental homes, just that he has a monthly income from them, explaining that she's not very good at finance talk. Their wedding was supposed to be this coming Saturday, and Anna tells the detective about the venue and plans, proud that they managed to budget the entire thing to $6,500. It'd just recently been paid in full, but Melinda had been the one to cover the tab, not Jeff. Jeff apparently had every intention to, even had the cash ready in hand and everything, but a water tank at one of the rental homes of his happened to break, causing him to use the money to fund the emergency repairs. Jeff's mom tried to make it to the bank on time to get him money, but that hadn't worked out either. This was the reason why everyone had been at Applebee's waiting for her, so Jeff's mom could pay Melinda back. Anna served the entire time, taking a short lunch break, and noted that Jeff arrived just before 7 with Aurora in her car seat, and her dad about 10 to 15 minutes later. She remembers thinking it was really weird that nobody could get a hold of her, and that she wasn't showing up to be paid back the money. Melinda hadn't exactly been thrilled about maxing out her credit cards at the last minute. But of course, Anna's mind didn't go to anything dark. She assumed that her mother had just run into some students or friends. Melinda knew everyone, and she always made time to stop and chat. Jeff's mother wasn't at Applebee's either, because Melinda had told Jeff earlier that day that she wouldn't be able to meet up with his mother due to a doctor's appointment she had. You can tell that as Anna is explaining all of this out loud, she's tripping over details that now confuse her. It didn't really make sense why an afternoon doctor's appointment would get in the way of an evening dinner. And even so, why wouldn't her mother show up to collect the money? I got a little worried. I, I didn't think something horrible happened because she runs into people she knows all the time. She's a teacher. Everybody's like, oh, this is plastic. And where we go? Yeah. Was Jeff's mom there? Had she no. Made she didn't show up? Jeff, my mom earlier in the day had apparently told Jeff that she couldn't meet her because she had to go to a doctor's appointment, oh, okay. which was weird. But she, um, yeah, so his mom wasn't coming. And then later... It's just weird that she wouldn't show up to collect money. So I don't know what went, what went up with that. But I still expect her, I was going to call her and be like, why aren't you coming? But again, there weren't really any major alarm bells going off. Bruce told Anna that he couldn't get a hold of Melinda either. She'd actually stood him up on their dinner plans, but maybe that was because the plans hadn't been concrete. Maybe she'd forgotten it was supposed to be at Applebee's. When it came to this kind of stuff, Bruce often just metaphorically threw his hands in the air and tried to keep up. He was often the last to know about what was going on. He told Anna that he was going to get a quick workout in at the rec center and then come by for dinner. 
While Jeff and Bruce ate their burgers, they all continued to wait for Melinda, who never showed up. Anna still had a few hours left in her shift. She was in between tables when Jeff texted her at 8.39 p.m. Instead of alerting her that an emergency had happened, he tells her to call him when she's done work for the night. And then later, Jeff messages me going, text me when you get cut. And I was like, I just called him instead because I had already been cut. I was like... Hey, I just have a little bit. I'm just waiting to do my checkout. Like, you know, where you give them your money, calculate tips for the host and everything. And then he's like, he gave the phone to my dad, and my dad told me my mom had been stabbed a bunch of times. And I started screaming and crying out back where the smokers go by the dumpsters. So it's right out our back door. Anna offers over her phone so the detective can look through yesterday's text messages. Most of them aren't replied because she was working and tends to stay off of it during her shift. The detective lets out a sigh as he scrolls through dozens of unanswered texts from Jeff, trying to figure out where Melinda is. She gives him permission to send himself screenshots of everything, and they continue on with the questioning. Anna explains that she doesn't really have a set schedule of when she's done work. They just let people go based on labor laws and how long they've been there. She was about to leave anyway when Jeff texted her, and a co-worker drove her home as she was too upset to drive. When she got to the house, a police officer stopped her, apologized for her loss, and when Anna asked if her mother was dead, he said yes. The family spent the night at her Uncle Scott's house, and Jeff went to his mother's with Aurora, because the baby's familiar with his mother's place. The detective circles back to some of the text messages that were on Anna's phone, wondering if she spoke to Jeff on the phone at any point. She mentions that they had a phone call in the afternoon, but she's not sure what he was doing all day. He's always busy running errands. He would have been home around 3 p.m. to meet Kyle getting off of the bus after school. It was Kyle's routine to get off the bus and go straight to his room until dinner, but there was a chance that he witnessed the murder. Kyle had been home when Melinda was killed and alone with her dead body for hours. When Bruce and Jeff arrived at the house, they'd knocked for minutes before Kyle managed to open the front door. Anna says Kyle would probably let a stranger in the house. He doesn't have a deep level of discernment when it comes to strangers or boundaries. He gets comfortable with people pretty fast. The detective asks what Kyle is like when he's upset, which is making noises, stomping his feet, occasionally crying. He's nonverbal, so his self-expression tends to be physical. He can say mama, brucey, ah for Anna, mmm for Megan, and baby for Aurora. He loves the baby and always gets super sweet and gentle around her. The detective is wanting to establish two things, a baseline idea for what Kyle is like and also whether he has any kind of violent tendencies. Kyle had been grunting a lot while the detectives were there taking initial statements at the home, and he's wanting to establish what kind of emotional state this behavior could mean. Understandably, it's difficult to gauge, because there was so much action around the house with authorities and paramedics coming and going, and nothing about that was normal for Kyle to experience. With any homicide investigation, police will always ask the obvious question, is there anyone you can think of who would do this? And for the most part, Melinda's life was void of any issue, save for two things. Recent problems with attempted break-ins, and an old college buddy of Bruce's who was beginning to finally wear out his welcome in the couple's lives. Over the past year, the family had been dealing with attempted break-ins, stolen items, stolen car keys which would be used to set off their car alarms at all hours of the night. Someone even put nails in Bruce's tires. They couldn't figure out whether someone was trying to rob them or just terrorize them, but either way, it was working. They even installed security cameras, one in the front and in the back, with the feed going straight to Melinda's phone, but it still didn't stop the strange activity, and nothing was ever spotted. A lot of the times, there's still problems with the feed, and they'd come home to one of the camera wires having been cut. That's really strange. You'd think they'd just steal the camera, the detective tells Anna, and she agrees. Because it's all strange. No signs of forced entry ever. Stealing the car keys, but never stealing a car. Attempting to break in, but only having random petty cash from inside the house go missing. The detective's eyebrows furrow with cynicism as Anna describes all the issues they've been dealing with. The downstairs apartment that they live in has a sliding glass door leading out to the backyard, and Anna found it unsettling that someone might be trying to break in. It'd been so bad that she started keeping cash in her shirt and showering with her wallet in the bathroom with her. Jeff had also told the family that recently, when he was about to let Moose out in the backyard, two grown men were right there at the sliding glass door, apparently about to break in. The police had been notified numerous times. Between the stress of a newborn and a job that easily takes up more than 40 hours of her week, she tries not to think about it. 
Because you said it wasn't uh, Everything is like random. Nothing goes, like nothing big is missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, tools, Jeff had a bunch of tools go missing. I try not to think about it because it pisses me off too much when stuff goes missing. So we have tools. All the doors were usually locked, and the garage door leading to inside the house required a code. Bruce and Melinda had keys for the front door, and everybody had the garage code. The front door also had a bolt lock from inside that everyone knew not to use, which is why they needed Kyle to come down and open the door. The code wasn't working either. Anna speculates that maybe the wire for that was cut just like the cameras. Jeff and Bruce had told all of this to the police initially when they arrived on the scene, and even then, the detective noted that it struck him as odd. Whether adults or neighborhood kids, it certainly was a leap to go from setting car alarms off in the middle of the night to slaughtering somebody and leaving a witness behind. When it comes to Bruce's college buddy, he seems to be at the top of Anna's list in terms of possible suspects. For starters, his nickname is Spaz, and then it just seems to get worse from there. He's like, he stinks, he's drunk, he's in everybody's face, everybody's been talking about how he's doing coke lately. He shows up to parties and screams at people, freaks out, leaves, threatens people. And what kind of threats? I'm not really sure. My dad was saying, well, but he'll insult people, call him the N-word. Mm -hmm. If you don't buy him a beer, he calls you Jewish. It's, it's just rude. Have you seen him be violent? I haven't anything? seen it. I've heard everything. Physical. Though. Okay. Bruce had brought him up while he'd been speculating all night long, but the detective seemed to come to the same conclusion he had about it. Jumping from those behaviors to murder just didn't make sense. What would his motive be, and how would he have known that Melinda was even home? He doesn't want to offend Anna, but Stoltz explains that he has to be clear to everyone in this case. Even if the Pleskovic family members found it difficult, Stoltz would need to treat this like any other homicide, working his way out from those closest to the victim, both intimately and physically. So he asks her, how have things been at home? Before she has a chance to answer, her phone buzzes. Ugh, another reporter. Anna silences the call. She's had to block numbers left and right of reporters that won't leave her alone. The 911 calls have already been released and everything is a frenzy. The detective takes this chance to advise her on being careful with her social media use and honestly, not pay attention to anything right now because there's a lot of people who will say anything and everything behind a keyboard with no second thought. She doesn't have any interest in talking to reporters, and he agrees that this is a time to keep your inner circle small, with people who will support you fully, as it's so vulnerable for the whole family. Unfortunately, 911 calls are taken through a third party. He assured Anna that they didn't release it, and when the occasional press release is given from the department, it will be with the utmost respect and extremely brief. Getting back to his question, Anna tells him that for the most part, everything was normal and fine. Sure, everyone butts heads here and there, and everyone was extra stressed because of the wedding coming up. Her parents weren't always thrilled about Jeff's attitude, though, and she mentions a recent fight between Jeff and Bruce. No, did everybody get along? My dad and Jeff, like, were yelling at each other the other night, but, like, my dad got really drunk, and once in a while he does... Sorry, Are you fine? Are you fine? Once in a while he does this, and, uh... He doesn't remember anything, and he'll go off on somebody, like, through text or phone. And uh, he went off on Jeff, and they are like, fighting all night. They got, they got a little Bruce had a few too many beers, and it got the best of everything he'd been biting his tongue over. He's mostly a social drinker, and rarely overdoes it. He'll drink to cope when he's stressed, and for some reason the other night, he just had it in for Jeff and was so tired of his lack of help around the house or ambition to move forward in life. It didn't take place in person, the argument both took place and was resolved over text message. Stoltz asks her if Jeff and Bruce had mentioned anyone they thought it was. Jeff didn't seem to have a clue, besides maybe the people who'd been trying to break in and mess with them this whole time. He'd come by her Uncle Scott's place last night after Aurora was settled in, holding Anna and assuring her that everything would be okay. He was worried because Anna had dealt with depression in the past and attempted suicide. She explains to the officer that she was 15 at the time, things had been difficult, and she wasn't on the right medication. The Pleskovics weren't necessarily a super emotional family, so to speak. They'd been raised as athletic and adventurous kids, and through that, their tolerance for both physical and emotional pain was high. That, on top of the fact that Anna was still in a high level of shock, is why she was so calm and almost monotone to some degree. Yawning, stretching, playing with her hair. She's exhausted. Her dad barely slept. He tends to talk a lot and babbles on when he's upset, she tells the officer. He would cry occasionally, and he twitches a bit when he's under a lot of stress. He, too, was barely showing it, she says, but she knows him well enough to see that he's devastated. 
Her parents had a great relationship. They were best friends. They had their arguments like any normal couple, but they were always resolved quickly. They were super social, a lot of fun. They did everything together. While he'd been scrolling through her phone earlier, the detective mentions text messages she got from Jeff on Sunday afternoon, telling Anna she needed to call him ASAP. Anna said when she called, he told her that he got into a car accident. He'd been using another car of his father's and a driver T-boned him. Jeff was fine, but his face was scratched up from an airbag being deployed. Anna wasn't sure what shop he brought the car to exactly or what the damages were, but Jeff said it had been pretty bad. But it's okay that Anna doesn't know the details. Jeff mentioned that the police came to the scene and insurance was exchanged, so there should be records they can look at. Understandably, it's important to rule out any physical injuries that the family members have. And finally, she's asked if there's anything in the house that she'd consider a weapon. She mentions that Jeff is a huge gun fanatic. He gets it from his dad. They've enjoyed shooting together at ranges ever since he was a little kid. Jeff had guns in the house, but Anna hadn't known it until she heard him telling the police after Melinda was found. She doesn't seem to mind much, though. There wasn't ammo packed with them, and Jeff would be safe about that kind of thing. She actually had no idea where he was even keeping them. But having a gun in the home was something they had talked about previously, planning to keep one in their future house for safety and protection. She doesn't go shooting with him, though, because guns tend to make her nervous. Bruce and Melinda didn't own guns, and Melinda would have most likely preferred to not have any in the home. Other than Jeff's guns and a couple of his pocket knives, there's pretty much nothing else in the house that she can think of. Anna was brought in again for a second interview to clarify a few more things for authorities. The main point of interest is trying to pinpoint who exactly came up with the idea to go to Applebee's. Jeff's mother reached out through Jeff. He'd been at his Aunt Jeannie's before dinner, ran out of gas on the way there, got caught in the rain, and stopped by the house to change before dinner, but he couldn't get in. The garage code wasn't working. Anna wasn't sure how he got gas or ended up at his Aunt Jeannie's, so Anna told him to just come to Applebee's, and they'd figure it out. Megan is usually about an hour away at Hiram College campus, getting her master's in interdisciplinary studies and coaching softball. Once she graduates, she's hoping to continue coaching and maybe teach a few classes. She clings to the tissues in her hands, the aftermath of gathering herself emotionally before coming into the interrogation room. Like Anna, she's extremely polite and responsive, legs crossed and hands in her lap, more casual than you would maybe expect her to be. But the detective's questions about school and routine are a welcome emotional distraction. Megan was home to see the baby and help with the wedding. But instead of standing as maid of honor for her sister, she'd now be burying her mother. Detective Stoltz doesn't circle the bullseye as slowly as he did with Anna. Instead, he goes straight to the person he's most interested in, Jeff. His account of what he'd done that day at the scene didn't make sense, and Anna's description of the vandalism and chaos sounded like it was coming from inside of the home rather than out. As with any investigation, they'd keep an open mind, but they weren't looking for some pissed-off neighbor kids or a resentful ex-college buddy. Whoever killed Melinda had most likely been a man who was angry with her, with the opportunity to shoot and stab, the motive to do so, and the means to see it through. Nobody else in the home had a firearms license and a liking for knives besides Jeff, who she knows goes shooting regularly with his dad. As far as authorities were convinced, there were only two possible men who that could be, and they both lived with Melinda. Cutting to the chase, the detective asks Megan if, besides problems with the neighbors or what's been going on with the house, is there anyone she can think of who would want to hurt her mother? But Megan, understandably removed from the day-to-day -day life of her family, isn't exactly sure. They ask about Jeff, and Megan says she's never known him to be angry or violent. She also mentions Spaz, who everyone recently made a point to remove from social media because he was starting to burn bridges left and right. And she touches on how challenging it can be to plan a wedding when one half of the family is unreachable. We just met your family, so we don't really know who's capable of what. Do you... You know, if I could ask, um, is, is Jeff the type of person that would be upset or be physical or violent in any way? Have you ever seen him? I've never seen him get like that. Um, and, like, just based off, like, people that I know from high school, too, nobody's ever really seen him get like that. Mm -hmm. um, usually if he gets, I mean, when you have that many people living in a house, arguments happen and stuff. But he would just that's, go downstairs and normal, yeah. shut it out. There was yeah. never really... Well, nothing ever really got physical. Like, actually, it never did, so. Yeah. It was always, 
nothing, there weren't really too many arguments either. It was always just, hey, can you do more around the house kind of a thing. Um, yeah, I would have heard that a bit here. Mm-hmm. So, a little help helps. Um, yeah, I don't think that he would ever mm-hmm. get violent by any means. What about um, any other family members or uh, friends? Friends of your parents? Um, friends of Jeff's? I mean, I, is there anybody that you could think of that just comes to mind where... You know, as we're trying to piece together, I'm sure you guys are too, and mm-hmm. just looking back on, is there anybody that... Um, well, we had it me and said, like, hey, make sure that you get, like, take him completely off of, like, your, make sure he doesn't have you on social media and stuff like that. Like, there was, like, a falling out, and he's kind of burned a lot of bridges with a lot of people and lost his temper quite a few times. Um, then... I don't know, like, Je- I know Jeff and his dad used to not get along very well. Um... But I thought that, that was pretty mended once oh. the baby came into the picture. So. Yeah, how are his parents? Are they, did, your, did his parents, your parents, get, get along? Um, they're very, like, private people. So, like, her, his mom would come over to, like, hang out and watch their, like, see the baby and stuff. But it was usually just for, like, short periods of time. Um, but I've met his mom once, and I've never met, like, the rest of his family. But I'm also not there all the time. Right. Um, but I don't know. They seem... Very, like they like to keep their information private like we never had even with all the wedding planning and stuff like we never had his mom's cell phone number we never had his sister's cell phone number and she was a bridesmaid and stuff um, and those are things where like we would ask Jeff and he'd kind of be just a little bit stand not standoffish but just kind of be like eh, they don't like that information getting out and I was like I mean I'm okay whatever but it makes it a little bit hard to do wedding plan yeah Kyle could definitely be mischievous and playful He's grabbed a pair of keys once or twice from the counter and jingled them in his hands, jokingly running to another room in the house. But he wasn't one to rummage through anyone's belongings or take money. She says she's known him to throw temper tantrums or hit his head sometimes when he's upset, but he's not violent at all. He's quite sensitive to it, actually, often covering his eyes or ears. Even when Anna and Megan would fight when they were younger, he would get upset and tell them to stop. The detective asks about self-soothing behaviors, mentioning that Kyle was rocking and grunting a lot at the scene. Again, the detectives are most likely curious about Kyle's baseline behavior and also any communication efforts on his part. After all, he was the only person who had been in the house at the time of the murder, but unfortunately, he couldn't say a thing. The detectives circle back to the instances of theft and attempted break-ins, most of which Megan wasn't home for. She explains that Anna had a bit of a troubled time in high school, And after Aurora was born, she did a complete 180 in terms of her behavior and habits. So for a short while, they thought that maybe it was someone from her old crowd. But when things started to get more serious and involve missing belongings from inside the house while the doors were locked and everybody was home, they obviously knew that wasn't the case. Megan hasn't experienced much of it since she's not there 24-7, although once her grandmother had given her a gift while she'd been away, and when she got the chance to open it, the money inside the card was missing. And I don't mean to make this sound uh, accusatory or anything, but I would like to know, when this stuff started happening, would you in, say it correlated with uh, Jeff moving in at all? The, you know, the strange things, the things missing? Yeah, um, I mean... I just feel like we kind of need to ask that, because yeah. he did move in with, uh, mm-hmm. with Anna. And I think that's... Do the time frames correlate? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You think and so? that's something that, like, I've talked to my parents about and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, we don't want to, like, sit there and, like, sure. play the blame game and stuff Absolutely. like that because that can impact. But did anything but. did anything ever happen that um, helped you make, you know, rule Jeff out? Like, did anything ever happen where you said, oh, well, it couldn't have been him because this? Or was there really never anything that, that sort of cleared him? Um, when the people started showing up at, like, the back doors and stuff like that. Um, Who saw the people at the back doors? Jeff saw one, and then I thought it was the second one I thought was in the family room, in the back sliding glass door. Um, I thought that was my mom, but I... I think that was Jeff as well. Was it? He had said he he was holding the door, and they were holding the door, and, you know, which it doesn't happen. You know, it's Mm -hmm. rare for Strongsville to be fighting over the door. But, um, yeah, but he said that was him. You know, and, and uh, like Sergeant Gravass is saying, you know, that, that your dad felt the same way a little bit. The timeline of Jeff moving in, some odd things happened. Yeah. You know, now 
might be missing small things. Mm-hmm. You know, you did it, but you're assuming someone in the house who needs some money is, you know, going to snatch a ten dollar bill here and there, twenty. Yeah. Um, just trying, you know. Yeah. Just trying for an explanation of things turning up missing. Yet Anna, you know, says all the doors are locked in the house. Yeah. I mean, let's be let's be reasonable. Mm-hmm. You're you're an advanced college student. Um, how did things turn up missing if if Everybody all the doors are locked and there's no sign of forced entry into the house? What's mm-hmm. what's you know? Kind of wanted your opinion of what you think's going on there. Yeah, I mean, I know like Anna had lost her keys once or twice that had house keys on them, which is why we changed our locks. Mm-hmm. And then when my dad had lost his car keys, there was a house key on that also. Right. Um, but I mean, definitely seeing the, I mean, that's something that my dad and I have talked about even since right when all the stuff kind of started happening mm-hmm. was the correlation between Jeff moving in and stuff going missing. Mm-hmm. You guys um, haven't talked about it. Yeah, like and at recently first, or the yeah, past? all the way through. I mean, anytime I was home and something would happen, we would kind of have that discussion. Um, it made my sister and Jeff's relationship very rocky. Um, he has that fine line. You don't want to accuse him of something. Yeah, for sure. But, th- but then there's no explanation other than this new person that entered your home when prior to that there was nothing going on. Yeah, so. yeah, that's a tough. That's a tough one to to, to deal with. When he asks Megan if there's anything else she wants to say, or anything she needs to get off of her chest, she mentions that she just wants to add that she doesn't think Anna and Jeff have the healthiest relationship. They fight a lot, and in her sister's defense, she has no idea what it's like to have a child with someone, but even though he isn't violent, he's just a lot. He doesn't like being told what to do, or how to do it. And at one point, she mentions that Melinda was seriously afraid of what all his backing out of the wedding obligations could mean. Megan, over the one, were you home all weekend? I, well, my sister's bachelor party was Saturday, so we took her to Cedar Point when I got out of class at 12. Um, we got back around 1, um, and then... 1 uh, in the morning? I'm sorry, 1 in the morning. morning. Um, so Sunday morning? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jeff's sister stayed overnight, and that was when, when I was at Cedar Point, I, my mom was talking to me, um, like kind of calling me between rides and stuff because... The deposit hadn't gone through, so she was worried that maybe he was backing out. And then um, on Sunday when he had left, he took Ellie, his sister, and Aurora um, to run errands and stuff and then go meet his mom. Um, and my mom texted me and said, I just want to make sure that, like, is the baby with you? Or Actually, Aurora stayed behind, and he, she said, is the baby with you? Because, and I was, I was like, yeah, like, it's kind of normal. And she was like, okay, like, I'm afraid that since he's backing out of all this financial stuff, that he's going to take the baby and, like, leave completely. Um, but then that kind of seemed to solve itself throughout the rest of the day. Your sister but was afraid of that? Or your mom? My mom was afraid of that. You my sister wasn't. Okay. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I had... It was wrong for me to think that, but sometimes I thought my parents could be a little bit paranoid. The day before Melinda's murder, everything had mostly been normal. Megan does some singing, so she went to a recording session until 2 p.m., and Melinda and Bruce spent the day on their new boat. Sometime in the afternoon, Jeff went to go get the deposit money from the bank, but soon sent a text message to Anna saying that he'd been T-boned by another car, broke his thumb, and wouldn't be able to get it. So Melinda went with Anna instead to put the down payment on the venue, saving the day in her usual supermom style. Everyone else went to a restaurant called Brew Kettle for dinner, which was nice, Megan noted. They couldn't always have the entire family together like that. Dynamics were shifting and changing massively in every area of their family. It was nice to just sit down together and take it all in. So Megan wasn't paying much attention in the last 48 hours to the marks on Jeff's face and whether they were there before or after Melinda's murder. Even though Megan doesn't live at home full-time, she's been helpful to the police in giving more background. They thank her and apologize again for her loss. It's here now that, as the conversation switches from informative answers to her emotional state, Megan's voice begins to crack. The reality of what's happening is almost impossible for her to process. Megan asks if there's anything they can tell her, and the long and short of it is no, not yet. They're in the process of collecting information, and the time for pointing fingers will come later in order to maintain the integrity of the investigation. And that time was just around the corner. By now, Detective Stoltz was aware that there were three stressful situations going on in the Pleskovic home. The upcoming wedding, the chaos of the theft and attempted break-ins, and Bruce getting laid off from his job. 
From the outside looking in, none of these mitigating factors might seem enough to result in murder. But murder isn't a logical answer to anything. Even if the detectives had a working theory at this point, the investigation was like a juggling act, and it's important to keep all the parts moving so that you don't get too attached to one and let all the other options fall away. But they'd find Bruce to be extremely compliant and curious. He hadn't stopped thinking about who could have killed his wife since the second he found her. Detective Stoltz tells Bruce that they appreciate him coming down. They understand there's a lot going on right now, and they also add that he's free to go at any time. But Bruce shakes his head, hunkers forward with his elbows down on his knees. He's here to answer anything and everything they need. And he references a timeline that he'd written down for the police earlier. He isn't concerned with leaving. He's desperate to tell them everything that's been running through his mind. As with most cases, authorities want to start with anywhere from 48 hours before, right to the point of the crime. Often there's clues in those details. Most days are just that, like most days. But establishing a routine of the household and everyone in it allows the police to both verify alibis and also notice discrepancies or slight changes in normalcy. So Bruce describes his morning routine, which has been the same for years. He talks about Mel in the present tense the entire time, only sometimes realizing at the end of his sentences that he's describing the last morning he'll ever have with her. Bruce is the first to wake up in the house, then Kyle. He gets Kyle showered and ready. It's been their routine since he started high school. He mentions that Kyle crashes in his bed, and Mel sleeps on the couch. She likes to stay up later than he does at night, and she also has thyroid and fibromyalgia issues that make it difficult for her to go up and down the stairs. It's been that way for a while. Mel's up around 6, gets herself ready, and then tends to everyone else's morning routine details the way that a mother usually does. Kyle had just recently changed medications, and Bruce can't remember exactly when or what they are. Bruce and Mel had perfected their parenting over the years, and that kind of thing was where Mel's skills as a supermom took over. He almost winces as he describes the details of that morning, her cooking oatmeal for Kyle, how she always has a cup of coffee ready for him to drink on his way to work. It was perfectly imperfect, in that we fight once in a while, but we always have each other's backs healthy kind of way. They had started their entire lives together, basically as kids entering the world, not really knowing exactly what was in store for them. But what was in store was a beautiful home and a happy family life. Even when Kyle was born, they knew it wouldn't be easy to provide the support system he needed, but they were a team. And with that kind of foundation beneath them, they could handle anything. Graduation is around the corner, and he explains that, you know, of course, they love their kids, but it's a lot. Their daily routine was so demanding, and they were really looking forward to him transitioning to supported living outside the home. It hadn't been just the two of them for over two decades. Bruce only deviates to describe this dynamic for a short time before apologizing and getting himself back to the topic at hand, where someone who was guilty might want to welcome side tangents and unrelated stories. Bruce spared himself about 30 seconds before focusing on giving the detective more vital information. He's clearly been anxious to talk to them, and there's a reason why he wants to hurry up and get past the morning. Because in Bruce's mind, it's the afternoon of Melinda's death that holds all the clues of what happened to her. However, that morning was also a little bit different. The night before, the family had gone out to a restaurant called Brew Kettle for dinner, and when Bruce got home, he noticed that one of his tires was flat. Long story short, he put a temporary spare on, but by the time he got onto the highway, he had to pull over. It was this whole thing. He called Mel, she came to get him, and then Megan drove him back to his car to change the tire. After the whole mess, he got to work around 9 a.m. There were texts on his phone letting his boss know what happened and that he'd be late. Sometime when he was pulled over, a state trooper also stopped to see if he was all right. In case the police wanted to verify that, they could look it up, he suggests. Then he went to work, and he was in his cubicle all day, just like normal. The topic of losing his job comes up, and naturally, sure, it was a source of stress. But Bruce and Melinda had come up with a game plan about downsizing anyway. Once all of the kids were out of the house, their financial needs and budget would change, and they weren't thrilled, but they weren't exactly losing sleep over it either. The end of his workday is when Bruce says things start to immediately switch from a normal day to strange occurrence after strange occurrence. He specifies to the detectives that most of this is in hindsight. While all of this was happening, it was just happening, without much attention paid to it. But now, lining up event after event, Bruce knows something was wrong. And it all started with a text message from Mel near the end of his workday that said, Meet me at Brew Kettle. But, uh, so... But it was kind of weird. I was at my desk, and that's when I got the test to meet me at the brute kettle. And if you saw the statement I wrote tonight, it makes no sense that Mel... Mel doesn't meet you at brute kettle. 
Mel doesn't send texts like that. We always, you know, our thing is we go out, since we both work, we go out to eat a lot, you know, we meet, meet up. But it's always about, hey, you want to go out to eat? You want to go out or you want to eat at home? Or we go back and forth. We always take a while because we don't know what we have, we have taste for. And you'll, you'll see my st- the statement that I wrote. In hindsight, I realize that statement makes no sense, and I don't think she typed that to me. In hindsight of all that happened to me. I, 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 that makes no sense to me. What because there are so many other things we're supposed to do, and I don't get this money with the six. I, I don't. What time does she text you to it's very the uh, It was 425, the phone. I, I was showing the police. I was showing like two or three people, and then I showed you, I think. And, and, and how did, what was your reply to that? I sent a bunch of replies. I, I need my phone to reply to show you. I have the times. They're all there. You, Wait, but yeah. in but in one of those texts, do you agree to, to meet her there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my. I, was, I told her I can. I can't remember the exact words, but I said, "Well, I, I'm still at my desk. I'm working late, but I'll, but I'll meet you there. But I'll see you there." He tells Detective Stoltz that he's going to try to stick to a timeline of what he did as much as he can. But it's hard because the second he walked into the house and saw Mel lying on the floor, he began to look at every single thing through that lens of hindsight. And he has to keep mentioning why he thinks that text message points to something significant. He isn't sure what, but he knows something isn't right. They were just there the night before. Mel doesn't even really like the place that much to begin with. But there was a Walmart within walking distance... Bruce needed a nice notepad for an interview the next day, and Kyle needed underwear. Assuming Mel was just running late, he went ahead to go grab those. But even after all that time, Mel was still a no-call no-show. She hadn't said a thing since her meet me at Brew Kettle text. He finally texts her and says he's coming home. But that's when it got weird with Jeff and Anna, he says. But before he can get into that, the subject drifts to what's been happening in and around their home lately. This year, it was this weird things going missing, things getting stolen out of my car, keys going missing. Our car, someone has our car keys, and our car alarm has been going off, you know, every so often, you know. It, it, and we thought, we think it's a neighbor, and we think it's someone else. I'm going to wait till I see what you guys, but this stuff hasn't happened until they were living here in our, in our basement. Now, I'm not suspecting them of anything. I did, you know, we did confront and ask, you know, Jeff and Anna, you know. But he... He asked them what? If they if they took the money or if they grabbed them. You know, I, I'm not one to accuse, but you guys didn't grab the money. You know, at some point, you got to... They got to know we got to wonder if they're doing this or not. And... I mean, he's going... It's just been all, you know, these attempted break-ins. I wasn't there when these things happened. I don't think it's all bullshit. I mean, it, it theoretically, it could be. I'm not trying to blame them. I just no, no. I just but I'm, when I look to... back and think through some stuff, it's like these things are happening. But I'm not there when these things happen. I, when I, I've lived in that house 16 years, and we kids kicking the door. The one time was one of the story. You know, there's a group of kids that are all 15. They did this, and Jeff was in the basement when this happened. I wasn't there. I didn't see it happen in the middle of the night. I was asleep. Another one, two guys with hoods walked up to the back room there, and or the dog was. I don't, I don't know if, if this actually happened or if he's making it up. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking right. I, I, I'm not trying to put him on the spot or anything, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't there in the middle of the night when it was about two forty-five, and that everyone was woken up and wondered, and these guys took off all of a sudden. When Jeff grabbed the door, these two guys grabbed the door, and all of a sudden they took off. And then the, this last one yeah. was this past Thursday. Someone tried to open the door, and this kid took off. He jumped over the creek and was gone, up the, up the street behind our house. I wasn't there that it happened either. I just, if I'm going on his word that these things happen. Mm-hmm. And if if he was yeah. making it up, what would be your theory of why? why would you think he'd make that up? I don't know. The second detective says, you don't seem too happy about Jeff. And Bruce explains that it's not like they hate the guy. It's just that Jeff is all talk with no action. Their downstairs apartment is a mess. He doesn't contribute. He isn't motivated about employment. He's lazy. He takes no responsibility to help around the house, which is the least he could do, considering they don't charge him rent to live there. Mel and Bruce knew all too well what it was like to have to make financial sacrifices for your children. 
especially the learning process of having your first baby. They didn't want them to have to struggle. When they found out that Anna was pregnant, Jeff thought Bruce was going to beat him up, but Bruce encouraged them to stick together and take care of Aurora. But that's about the extent of what Jeff does, sleeps, snacks, and watches TV with the baby. Whenever he isn't doing the yard work or chores that he promised to do, it's usually because he's wrapped up in his rental properties. He'd recently told them that after the wedding, they'd be moving into a rental property of his that he was paying for in cash with his grandparents' help. Mel and Bruce hadn't seen any paperwork or keys yet, and he admits to the detective that the wedding had been a huge stress factor. In Bruce's words, Mel was on Jeff's ass about this wedding stuff. She was getting sick and tired of Jeff's apathetic attitude. After all, he was the one who proposed to Anna in the first place. He tells them about how he changed his mind at the last minute, and instead of going home, he went to the rec center for a workout. During his workout, Jeff called him, and Anna texted him, both telling him to go to Applebee's instead. It was weird for Jeff to call him. They don't even text that much, let alone call each other. He used the sauna for about 10 minutes and then left around 7-ish. Bruce explains the point of going to Applebee's and the chaos of trying to plan the wedding in the last few days. By the end of his own explanation, Bruce realizes he's coming to conclusions that don't make sense, but the answer to Melinda's murder is somewhere in those details. He starts to get nervous as he unravels, literally on the edge of his seat. And Jeff, who happens to be sitting outside in the police hallway right now, was just asking him what they were going to do about the wedding. Was he serious? Bruce was trying to contemplate the reality of life without his wife. And Jeff is worried about wedding plans? Okay, we put $500 down for the home. And Jeff said, I'll take care of the, I'll take care of the home. I'll take care of the home. It's like, okay. You know, all this time, you know, it's like the, because he paid cash for this house. And, and I, you know, Mel was actually looking it up to see if this house was actually, if, this, if they actually bought this house. It's in foreclosure. Mm-hmm. We, were, we, were, we were up at the Port Clinton at our boat on Saturday. We were just hanging out and we are just kind of thinking. And, you know, we think all this wedding plan stuff, this is all supposed to be paid for like a week or two to take care of. Sunday night, Mel sends Jeff a text Monday morning. This is, if you don't have it, this hall is going to get canceled. Jeff said, oh, I'll pay, I'm paying for everything. I'm paying for the hall. He has 92 guests coming. Has he sent any invites? I don't know. I don't know what's going on here. And so I had, I'm standing the deck on Sunday. And Anna comes down. Hey, Dad, I gotta, can you pay for the... I got. That's when Jeff said he got in his car wreck. I had to go down to the hospital. You know, another story. It, it, it's... And that money had to be, you're supposed to take care of this money all day Sunday while we were part Clinton. You're supposed to pay for it all day. Mm-hmm. And, you, and he was sitting around the house and he was napping. Now, him and, him and my wife have been kind of, they kind of butt heads. But well, what, what, is, what is your wife? I mean, you seem to kind of have some uh, disagreements on how he goes about uh, handling himself and how things he should be done. He's waiting to the last minute to do something. Yeah, so. but what, is, what, is, what does your wife think of him overall in general? What, is, what does she, she think of him? She likes she likes him, but every time she has says says something about something, he always talks you know bounces back a little bit. Mm-hmm. You could tell they were kind of the they kind of butt head personality wise they butt heads, but there was nothing you know. They, Does but, she get along better with Jeff than you do, or? Well, I'm kind of I'm kind of more laid back, so I get along with more people probably more often, you know, better. Yeah. Yeah, but he's but she's pushing you know girls when it comes to weddings it's it's a girls thing and, mm-hmm. I mean, and they're she's she's trying to help Anna out and they're because they're young and she's pushing the timetable of all this stuff. Well, Sunday night is when this money was due, and all day long, it, it's like excuses. There's all these like excuses and stuff. It's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. My wife told me she was meeting Jeff's mom Monday night to get the sick to pay it. We ended up having to pay the 6500 bucks Before we went to the brew cuddle Sunday night, I met Mel there. She took Anna. I took Kyle. She took Anna. We drove separate. She put up 3500 She put up the $3,000 check and 3500 on her credit card. Mm-hmm. And they were, he, he said he was going to take care of this like for all this time. All the, you know. Mel said his mom was going to take us all to dinner. And she's, she had the money and did not want to get to Jeff. It was just going to give it... To, to Mel's, you know, it reimburse for the, you know, for their end of the taking care of this. And what I don't get, that was supposed to happen tonight. What the fuck happened tonight? You know what happened, right? Do, do you know where they were supposed to meet? That you thought? or I don't get, what, I don't get this, that I'll meet me at Brew Kettle from Mel 
didn't come from her. She did not send me that. That wasn't. It came from her phone. I. She didn't send that. In my opinion, I'm a little scared right now. A little nervous about what the hell happened. I don't. Or who did this? I don't get it. it it's not the big deal, but 6,500, we're supposed to meet and dinner, and all of a sudden everything gets changed. Who's supposed to meet? All three of you? You well, and... Well, I, and I, I, heard, I hear... The thing about this, I always hear three or four different stories. I'm always kind of like, I'm the last, you know, last one. That, and then Mel said, it, she said yesterday or the day before that it was she was just going to meet her mom for the money. And then all of a sudden, Jeff has the money. Mm-hmm. And that's what I don't get. All of a sudden, he's involved now again. And now he's calling me to meet him at Applebee's, which is kind of different. Are we all getting together? And now he's out there, well, you think we should do this wedding? And now I'm like, I don't know what I was doing that. What was the last part you said? He asked you if we should do this wedding? When did you say that? Just just out there right now. What are we going to do? It's like, I'm talking, I'm thinking about my, my life with my wife is gone now. When when yeah, I, I'm just huh? When he called you, who did he say was all coming to Applebee's? When I went to Applebee's, I said something's not. Mel, Jeff said he tried to call Mel a bunch too, and Anna did too, and we tried texting her. Since Jeff and Anna were so insistent on him going to Applebee's, he left the rec center and headed over. He tells Detective Stoltz that Mel still wasn't there when he arrived, and he joked to Jeff that he'd hope nothing bad happened to her. But of course, he didn't think something actually had. Jeff was already there with appetizers, Bruce got a margarita and a burger. By the end of the night, any curiosity Bruce had about Mel's whereabouts had turned to worry, and he was anxious to get home. But in hindsight, it feels like everything took longer than it should have yesterday. He can't let the meet me at Brew Kettle text message go. The entire afternoon and evening are a mess. Even leaving Applebee's with Jeff and getting home wasn't like any other night. In Bruce's words, it felt like someone was wasting his time. It's like, did she get in a car? I'm thinking, like, did she get in a car wreck? Or, you know, or she, is there some kind of secret going on before the wedding? You know, like, are they, do they have some kind of plans with the girls getting, is there a get together? I don't know. I don't know about. That's why this meet me at Apple, it, it, it just seems suspicious now. Meet me, see, meet me at Brew Cup. I don't get that. It, 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 Mel, would, Mel would not, like I said, never, she would not, she would ask if you want to, she wouldn't even want to go to Brew Cup again. It, it, so in hindsight, I, it made no sense. I kind of felt whoever sent me that text did that. Now in hindsight, I think someone who ever sent me that text just didn't want me around for a while. Or just, because they know I can't come straight from work, get off right off the highway because I work downtown, come right off 71, just go there. And then... What was Jeff's response to you when you said it was all, don't think, Oh, don't think, no, don't. It's, just, it's like he, like, oh, don't, don't think like, like that, you know, something like that. You know, just, you know. If she's not getting, her phone's dead. I mean, one of the last things I said is, your phone dead? Because I'm sending these texts. What's going on? Because this has happened before when I sent her a bunch of texts. It happened, I don't know, a week ago or something, and her phone was dead. Okay, so at Applebee's. How long are you at Applebee's? Okay, so let me think about 715, I get there. Anna comes out with the margarita, and I order the burger. Jeff already has appetizers there on the table. He asked me if I want some. I said, oh, that's right. We hung out, we ate. I had another margarita. I had two more. I had three because they were like little ones there. And then how did I go home? What was kind of weird is Jeff left before me, but when we were pulling down, pulling down our road, he was behind. I pulled into the driveway first, and he was behind me. Or he, I pulled in first, and then he did. Oh, he was getting the baby ready, but he was like, we were, you know, we were in, he wanted me to help him. He was going to put the baby in. No, you know what? He, you guys walked out together? Yeah, we walked out together. And he said he grabbed a gallon, uh, he needed some gas in the truck, so he grabbed a bunch of, so he grabbed some gas from his dad's house. And he, it's like, a, he has these big five-gallon gas guys, and it's a big orange one, like we, and he was filling up his car. He had the ba- he had the door open. The baby was there, so I was standing. I was just hanging out, waiting with them. Where is this at? This was in the parking lot in front of Applebee's, right in front of Applebee's. Why would he? He grabbed a gallon. He said he grabbed that five gallon gas out of his dad's garage and grabbed it to fill it up. And he filled up his gas tank. I mean, it took a while for him to sit there. He was 
took him a while to fill it a little bit. But it was just kind of different. It was like, you know. And so then I went back to my car. Different how? What do you mean? Well, I'm thinking right now. It seems like from the time I got to, from Brookheadle to Walmart to there, like someone was wasting my time or something. Even though Jeff left the gas station before him, he pulled in behind him when he arrived at home, which also confuses Bruce now. He remembers thinking, how did I beat Jeff here? But he also had noticed the red car Mel was using in the driveway. After thinking things like she'd been in a car accident or somewhere with a dead phone, he was honestly a little frustrated and, of course, ready to head into the house and curious about what the heck was going on. It's here that Bruce stops again, stares hard and quiet. The realizations are coming in small waves. The toughest part of the conversation begins. What happened once Bruce walked into the home? Once they finally got let into the house by Kyle, he yelled for Mel and glimpsed a chair turned over on its side, instantly knowing that wasn't normal and something was wrong. It only took seconds for him to see Mel's body on the kitchen floor, with so much blood around her. Bits and pieces of it are blurry. He's not exactly sure where and what Jeff was doing at the time, besides getting on the phone to 911 pretty quickly. Other than that, he was too wrapped up in Mel. Recalling the details are difficult for him, displayed through his physical discomfort, but he's able to give his full account, occasionally moving positions in his chair and holding his head in his hands. I don't know what, and then I'm trying to figure out where, I'm thinking, okay, where's Mel? You know, I'm waiting for Mel, you know, usually she'll say something, you know, sometimes you'll hear, you know, she'll say something, or maybe she's busy on something. And that's when I noticed that the one chair, one of our chairs was... Kyle's chair, which is right here in the front, was actually over here and laying down on the ground in front of the dishwasher. And that's when I, and I walked in, and I'm like, you know, that's kind of, that's when I looked over to the left, and I asked her if she, you know, I asked Mel if she was, I couldn't believe the picture that happened right there. I was stunned. I, I, and then I noticed there's blood and then there's blood by her face. Mel, you know, she was face first. I thought maybe she slipped and fell and thing. So I, I went to the, I went this way. And my, I, you know, I, I just, I just kind of leaned down there. I, I didn't know what to do. And I'm looking and I said, Mel, are you okay? I wanted, I wanted to hold her. But then I'm realizing there's, there's chunk. There's a puddle here, there's a bottle right here, uh, face down. And I thought, that's when I realized, you know. And then I saw her back and there were, there was chunks. I, I asked her if she was okay. I, I, I wanted to say, hey, Mel, are you okay? Mel, I, I, I wanted to hold her or do something. But what do you do? I, I'm not a CPA. I, I just yelled. I just said, called nine. Jeff was immediately on this nine eleven call. Boom! He made the first call, and I was Did he you, was outside. I think I just don't. I, I just got up and ran out. I decided cut. I yelled it. Called myself, and you said you called. You told Jeff to call nine one one. Yeah, I yelled. I started. Yeah, I started yelling. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what I had when I, I honestly can't remember exactly everything I did at that I could tell I don't think she was I was yelling 9 Jeff to call 9 11 they came pretty fast everyone came, and I started I called a little later and I'm screaming I don't know what the hell I screamed I was just losing it did you did you check for a pulse or breathing or did you touch I was looking bell? did you move her at all I didn't move her I I got really close to her, but I didn't want, I realized I can't, you know, with all the, I, with, I tried to see if she was breathing, are you okay, Mel, are you okay? I, I you realize with what? That's when I, when, when you get, when I got close, that's when, in, in a few seconds, and, you know, it, the, 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 the cuts in her shirt, I go, she stay, I can't tell if she was, stay, I, I just couldn't believe what was happening in, the, in that. I don't know what, not a Jeff was on the phone real quick. He, he must have heard me yell or something. I don't know what. I did. I, I was just a blur. Jeff called. Jeff called. Yeah. 
And then does Jeff walk into the kitchen? When does he come into the kitchen? He must have been there behind me. I don't know. He must have been there behind me when, when I was yelling. I saw it. He maybe saw it. And what was Jeff's reaction? He down the He was he was freaking nine eleven. He called nine eleven too. He got him there real quick though. He was able to get him here, address everything. Boom. The detective asks Bruce who he thinks is capable of doing this to Mel. Like Anna and Megan, he mentions his college buddy Spaz, who's had a tough time recently. He has a history of burning bridges, meddling with people's personal lives, and he doesn't have the greatest boundaries. He jokes to Mel and Bruce once in a while about living in their basement once Anna and Jeff are gone. They both laugh on the outside while screaming hell no on the inside. He texted them a lot, sometimes inappropriately. He was drinking and doing a lot of cocaine to cope with recently losing his job. It was just all too much after a while, and the two of them decided to basically cut him out of their lives, instructing the kids to remove him from all social media too. And sure, spaz does sound, well, like a spaz. But Detective Stoltz explains that in the eyes of the police, he doesn't actually come across as a viable suspect. Going from inappropriate texts, being that annoying friend that doesn't know when to say when, is a long way from murder. Bruce puts one of his feet up against Detective Stoltz's desk, talking to the other detective and explaining why he thinks it's possible it could be him. Stoltz, who's been texting on his phone, leaves the room for a moment, He's most likely going to speak with detectives who are observing the interview in another room. After a few minutes, Stoltz returns and begins to question Bruce about some of his actions that day, as well as his feelings about losing his job. Bruce also mentioned that when he first arrived at Applebee's and sat down, he had left his phone in the car. The detectives are trying to establish why Bruce, who says he's concerned about Mel's strange behavior, would be fine sitting down without his phone after realizing she still wasn't there. But Bruce explains that he wasn't in a rush at first because both Anna and Jeff were also trying to call and text her too. And for Bruce to come in and immediately say that the first text he got from Mel was unlike her, it seems suspicious to the detectives that he just went with it. And what's with going to Brewkettle before he gets in a workout at the rec center? Some food and beer before the gym doesn't sound all that logical. He clarifies that at the time, he thought the text was a little weird, but he didn't think anything of it. Maybe Mel wanted to meet up to talk about something, maybe the wedding stuff. The average person, on the average day, isn't thinking that their wife must be murdered, and he hadn't planned on going to the rec center to work out until he drove to the restaurant in Walmart. His day was just a red bouncing ball following the lead of someone else, and he couldn't figure out who. This insight comes from Bruce mulling over every single action, every single word, and every single thing that's happened since he found his dead wife. It's not that the detectives are going with the husband-did-it theory, although they definitely need to cross it out. It's more so that if it wasn't Bruce, then it was definitely someone who knew him enough to pick Brew Kettle, and who knew that Bruce's time could be taken advantage of. And why would Mel not mention Kyle? They never left him home alone. He would have come with her to Brew Kettle, too. Bruce's leg is bouncing up and down. He's taking long, deep breaths. He's shaking his head. At one point, he presses his palm against his forehead and stares desperately at Detective Stoltz, as if he's begging for him to change it somehow. But you never texted her or tried to call her to tell her that you were at Applebee's. I would think that you would, that you guys would say, hey, we're here. Did I get a text her about Applebee's? Yeah. Yeah. Like, come up and meet us. Where are you? We're up here. I'm up here with Jeff. The baby and Anna's. I word. should have. I thought Mel, but I thought Anna said she called and texted her too. And Jeff, they were all three of us you were trying that, to get a hold of. Yeah, you said that earlier. I know, but it, once you're there, I would think that would be a topic. Like you said, like you asked Jeff. I had no you, idea. You about said it. to Jeff that I hope nothing happened to her. And I, I'm thinking in just, terms of car accident or right. I understand or she's, that. I understand that, but I just, I guess I'm just, I just, yeah, I, I guess if it was me, I'm just thinking, yeah. well, A, I'd re- definitely realize I didn't have my phone right away. I'd be calling or texting, especially when I'm now I'm with, you're with Jeff, and now it really seems even more funny than the night's getting. In hindsight now, yeah, it's, at the time, no, I In, in case of point, when you got. Because uh, we, 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 we divide and conquer a lot of times, so. Mm-hmm. In life, mm-hmm. and the case in point, going back to when uh, you I initially got the initial text to meet at the brew cut, you thought that was odd. Not initially, in hindsight. Mm-hmm. Okay. From her phone. Why? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Well, when you get a text like that, the brew cat on you were there the night before, which struck you as funny. Not at that time. I, I didn't. In hindsight, it seemed fun. it seemed odd, but because I'm trying to figure out is the brew kettle somewhere you go often together? Yes, it's part of the rotation. Okay, but not back to back days. So, but it, so, maybe, so somebody I know what you're getting. I just well, do you know what I'm getting at? So that's somewhere, you know. If I'm what, yeah, if I can I'm say that in hindsight. Now that what happened? Yeah, now now I'm thinking. Okay, what's what what let what's going on? Why am I getting on a wild goose chase? Goose chase. Yeah, but but that, you, you mentioned you mentioned being on text messages at the proof kettle, and you felt like no, it was, a, the, it was 4:25. Well, I'm just when saying, I this, you, and I was at work. You first mentioned you got the text message about being at the proof kettle, and then you then then you meet me at the proof kettle. I thought okay, I thought it was this thing like she I, wanted me to meet. I, she had something to say to me. Something I about that. the I, wedding. I'm just getting to the point that you you, you yeah. just keep on bringing up you keep on thinking that someone's trying to waste your time. In hindsight, now in, in hindsight, I'm thinking back. Yeah, but at the same time, you got text messages to what the brew kettle, and then eventually what from Jeff to go meet up at Applebee's, right? I got phone calls from Jeff. Okay, to meet up at three, Applebee's, three, right? Or, yeah, to about Applebee's. Okay. But about, no, no one told you to go shop at Walmart and go work out, right? Walmart is what I planned on doing at some point. That was uh, just on a. I'm just trying to make sense of this because you're saying that someone's wasting okay. time, but no one told you it'll be well, hard. No one told you. But if you look at my phone, I have an interview tomorrow, and I wanted to get. A, I'm waiting for a response and her to get back, and she must be caught up with friends. We thought she's. I don't know. She runs into well, people or something, so that's why I said, "Oh, I know to Walmart. Kyle needs underwear." Let me ask you this and, and help me out a little bit. For if you don't think that she sent you that text to go to the brew kettle, did I, now so, I don't think she did. In hindsight, I don't think so. Okay. I, I like to know where the hell her phone is. Okay, and fair enough. And uh, but it would have to be somebody that knows her, knows you yeah. to come up with that location. Exactly, I agree with you. So, well, I don't know about the boot kettle, and he's pretty short on those quick texts when he's messing with people. Yeah, but yeah. None, of them, none of them express the level of violence that yeah. we've seen today. Yeah, correct. Yeah. When calling someone liberal is not violent. When you see the comp, if you've ever seen a person, yeah, but it's, it's just like zero to sixty, like because that's <laughs> yeah. a big one eighty. What we just saw today, right? I mean, so, outside of we saw okay, the, let's just say for argument's sake, like you said, so you, and then you have your family, right? I no one in my family is capable of this because no, I, I no one I, in my family is capable of this. If it was somebody completely from the outside, how would they come up with that location? Exactly, I. It, you know, because I couldn't text somebody in my family and just pick a random place. I It'd have to make sense. Yeah, I agree. And, and a bar or a brewery definitely isn't a place that I'd text yeah. my wife randomly. If I, had a, if I was going to do something like this, I couldn't text somebody randomly to go to a bar or brewery like that. But we do. We we go out to eat all the time. Well, that's what I'm we, saying. Yeah. So and who would know? Who would know? I thought... <laughs> who, uh, who would know to pick a location like that? Meet me at the brew kettle. And then I send a response. But to answer my question, who would know? Who would that's know? What I'm, you know what I mean? It's, it's, who all knows I go to brew kettle? Somebody would have to know. Your, your routine. I mean, what do you Joe? do? It's not, it's, 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 a, it. it's, it's a, a popular it. place. You know, I, I, but I, I, it's, it's not, it's not the, would, probably the typical meeting place. But, but, who would know to do it? And who would know the likelihood that you you might go to you, okay, Walmart or you might go you, work Jeff, out? Jeff. I'm sorry, Jeff. What? Jeff would know. That. Bruce lowers his voice, motioning toward the hallway where Jeff is waiting to be questioned by police. He suggests that maybe it's Jeff's dad. He's never known Jeff to be violent in any way whatsoever. But Jeff had once said that his father didn't like Mel. The police say that it seems unlikely, but understandably, all of this seems unlikely to Bruce. At his worst, Jeff just seemed like a lazy liar. It didn't make sense for him to be so angry at Mel that he'd kill her. She was going to give him the... It's only 6500 fucking dollars. They killed her for 6500 fucking dollars. Mm. It's not them. If he has a house that he paid cash for that he said, I can't see that being a fucking thing. Mm-hmm. If, he paid, if that's the case, if they did that. Bruce continues talking to the second detective while Stoltz leaves the room again. 
He stares down at the floor, ruminating over all the things that have just come to light over the last two hours he's been in this interrogation room. He went into it an angry widower, and he's leaving terrified and confused. Stoltz returns and says they're ready to end the interview and they'll be speaking with Jeff next. But the questions in Bruce's mind are only just beginning. Another detective mentions that his sister called, and it sounds like there are a lot of family members at the hospital. So that's where Bruce is going to go. When Stoltz asks about Mel's condition, he whispers that she's passed. It appeared to Detective Stoltz that through everyone else's interviews and alibis, Jeff had most likely been the last person to speak to Melinda and see her alive besides Kyle. Initially at the scene, Jeff had explained a day with a lot of comings and goings, details, mishaps, setbacks, and otherwise. Jeff sat across from him in red pants and a black t-shirt, his arms crossed after a heavy sigh, and Stoltz asks him about his day and a few general questions. Authorities will often take the time to ask basic questions and get a baseline reading of someone's verbal and nonverbal activity during more candid moments. Between building rapport and also including open-ended questions, you're able to usually get a good amount of information. Stoltz feels differently about Jeffrey Scullin Jr., so he'll be interviewing him differently. He wants to make sure that Jeff dominates the conversation and feels safe enough to disclose anything, because Stoltz has a feeling something's up. Jeff describes the household routine since he's been living there for about a year. When he's asked if everyone in the house gets along, he says yes, but that Bruce drinks a lot, and when he does, he gets dickish, and the other day they argued. He came at me, Jeff explains, just verbally, over stuff I said I would help him with around the house, but apparently I wasn't doing it to his schedule, I guess. The next day he said sorry in a few text messages, and it's kind of water under the bridge. And he assures the detective that they're a very good family, and nobody has ever gotten physical before. Stoltz asks him about the wedding on Saturday, and Jeff says it's probably going to be cancelled. He doesn't know how many guests they were expecting, and admits that he doesn't really do much for the wedding. During the day, he's usually running around taking care of the rentals and helping his friends out. He also stays home a lot to mind Aurora while Anna's at work. He was HVAC certified, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, but he got laid off a few months ago. How do you get by financially? Stoltz asks. I've been using a lot of my savings, and Anna's been paying for all the small stuff to help me out until I get a job. Stoltz asks if he has any investments. Jeff says, my dad and I have rental houses, and he pauses for a second. I help him out with them. Jeff quietly trails off, and then shakes his arm out. He's frustrated, and he says, ow, and then grabs the paper cup on the desk and takes a swig of water. Jeff explains that there are six rental properties in total. He doesn't own any of them, he just helps his dad out. He doesn't know what his monthly income is from it because he doesn't get a designated cut. He just gets money from his father when he asks. Until now, Jeff's been able to exaggerate his father's business into one of his own. Jeff isn't a landlord, and he doesn't manage property. His father does. Jeff adjusts his t-shirt and leans forward. Can I ask you a question? Was everything with my dad's car okay? But Stoltz tells him that he hasn't heard anything yet. He asks about their dog Moose, who's still at the house. He may have to wait until it's done being searched, as a team is still there. Stoltz assures him that they'll look into it after this. Jeff apologizes, and they continue on. He explains that his mother Carla and his father Jeffrey Scullin are still legally together on paper, but their marriage is iffy, and it's a complicated situation. And again, when it comes to his routine, he doesn't really have a set one. On this day, he woke up around 10.25 in the morning to take care of the baby because Anna was leaving for her shift at Applebee's. He made Aurora some food, got himself some breakfast, watched Barney, and then they both had a nap. Around one, Mel came in, and he tells Stoltz about the plans for Mel and Carla to meet up and sort out the wedding finances. But he confuses himself, telling Stoltz that he's tired, rubs his face, shakes both his hands out again, takes a swig of water, and tries to start over. And she walked in. We were going to meet my mom. She helped pay for the wedding because I didn't have enough money and my card wasn't going through. So she gave me some money, but then I was late, so they ended up going up there to pay for it. But we were all gonna meet for dinner later that night. I was gonna go pick my mom up after she got home from work, and I was gonna be like, hey, they wanna go have dinner, let's go have dinner at Applebee's. It was gonna be this nice little thing. Well, Mel said she didn't wanna do that, and she just wanted me to go grab the money and everything. And I was like, okay, well, I'll do that when mom gets home. So I left. No, I didn't leave. I'm skipping ahead. I'm sorry, I'm really fucking tired. It's okay. 
So where you, where you, was it? Well, I mean, you're at you're at home. Mel came home at one, so we're at one o'clock, and then the plan, the plan was. Really it's fine. That's no, okay. The the plan was to meet for dinner, but Mel didn't want to do that, and she asked you to go get. She asked you to meet your mom. Go grab the money. I, I had to go grab like six hundred bucks from my mom and the rest from my banker. Mm -hmm. But Mel asked you to do bucks. that. She asked me to go do that, and I said I'd do it when she got home. And she said okay. And that wasn't an issue. That was the end of the conversation. Okay, get six hundred bucks from mom. Okay. And then. And then you just told her after work. And her excuse. Yeah, I told her when she got home. Okay. Where does your mom work? Just like she works at a bank downtown. I'm sorry. Where was I? I'm. Um, well, it's just it's still one o'clock. Um, I'm supposed to meet for dinner, um, but she said Mel's she would. She said she had to do something. She wouldn't elaborate, which I, you know, I'm not going to press. It's not my business. So I was like, okay, whatever. Okay, and but she, kinda, she couldn't. She just didn't say anything, and then she said she was going to the doctor, and that I might need to get Kyle off the bus, which I get Kyle off the bus most days when because everyone works during the day, which isn't a big issue. Kyle got off the bus at 3, like usual. Mel got home shortly after. Jeff took Aurora and headed to his Aunt Jeannie's, as he was going to help her out with some yard work around her place. But then he ran out of gas, in the pouring rain, on the side of the road. He had some empty gas tanks with him, and the station was within sight. So basically he had to figure out how to grab gas and get back to the car, in the pouring rain, with the baby. But as luck would have it, a good Samaritan drove by, right at the perfect time. Uh, you ran a gas on uh, Drake Road. Did you know where at on Drake? Um, within view of Gecko, like maybe two. You're, you're in your truck. Yeah, right. I was pulled aside the road. I had hazards. You were by Gecko. Yeah, I had my two gas tanks in the back, but they were empty. What kind of? Uh, how big are those? Like five gallon gas tanks? Just tank? two five gallon ones. They're they're in the back of the truck. If you, next, if you go over, but uh, the there was a nice man who stopped. I was gonna. I pulled out an umbrella, this little umbrella, I was going to walk with the baby carriage and the thing, like, I couldn't find my phone, I didn't know where it was, but uh, I was, I was going to walk, the plane was, but someone stopped and asked if I needed help, and I gave him $10, and he went and filled the gas can up and brought it back, he was very nice. Okay, so you, you weren't near Gecko within walking distance, huh? Well, no, I, w I could see it, is what I'm saying, I was in a view, Okay. not like walking distance, walking okay. distance. I could see, like, the corner of the sign. Okay. Um, so somebody, you gave him 10 bucks, he filled them up? Yeah. And then right after, right after that, uh, he didn't, he didn't want, you didn't, didn't offer, you didn't go with him? No, I had the baby. Uh, I, I didn't want to get a stranger's car with the baby. Okay. So he fills them up. I figure worst case is he steals my gas tank and $10. Best okay. case is he came back and he, I mean, he seemed like a really nice old guy. He had mm -hmm. Red Lincoln and pulls up and asked if I was okay. <laughs> but I called my dad right after that and let him know I was on my way to Jeannie's. I got there, she was waiting for me. I was late because I had to stop and get gas and stuff. But what, do you know your dad's phone number? <sighs> no, I don't. Not off the top of my head. Why do you need to call him? No, I just... No, right. I'm, I'm listening. Um, so you called him. You told him uh, you're on your on your way to Angie's. That's his sister. No, it's a uh, mom's sister. It's like a cousin. Oh. We just call her Aunt. Okay, because close family. Gotcha. Yeah, I do the same thing. Um, okay, you call him. So you you fill up your gas. Yeah, I stopped to get go put gas in, and I went straight. Oh, okay. So you did you. Uh, did he fill up both those cans? No, he only he only filled up one. He only put ten bucks in one. There's still gas in it. I stopped and put six bucks in. That's all I had. Into your, right into your car. Right into my car, just to get me there and there. And then I kept the gas. Did you pay with cash? Uh, yeah. I might have the receipt in the truck. I probably threw it down. I'm really glad. Jeff doesn't have a receipt, and he isn't exactly sure what the timeline is, but he estimates getting to Jeannie's sometime around 4.30. That would put him on the side of the road for more than an hour. That's a long time, Stoltz says. Jeff tells him that he was stuck there, and he didn't know what to do, and he also couldn't find his phone. He leans back, sighs, and wipes the sweat off of his forehead. Interrogation rooms are usually kept pretty cold. 
They aren't a place that authorities want someone getting comfortable during questioning. But Jeff is running hot. And he's not interested in talking about the details of this running out of gas story, but Stoltz is. Jeff rubs the back of his neck with both hands. He's said multiple times that he's really tired, but his body language shows more stress than exhaustion. Body language isn't always just about what the person is doing, but also how they're doing it. Are they being expansive and taking up space with their movements? Or are they attempting to shrink and minimize themselves? Are their movements jerky and stiff, or do they flow naturally? This is why establishing a baseline as much as you can, even in extremely chaotic and stressful circumstances, is crucial for observing what someone may be telling you without words. Okay, and then you go to your, uh, your aunt's yes. on Abigail? On Abigail Lane. Is uh, anybody home? Yeah, Jeannie was there. Okay, do you know what time you get there now? How long does all this take? Mm-hmm. You left shortly after 3. What time do you think you got to her house? Probably 4.30. That's a long time. I was stuck there for whatever. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't find my phone. Four three ish, probably a little bit before, a little bit after, I'm not sure. I got there, I was talking to her for a while. Okay, let me let me uh, just backtrack a little bit. Right. Um What do you mean you couldn't find your phone? I couldn't find it for the longest time. It fell, if you look at the truck, I don't know if you took a good look, the two seats, the way they come together, they go like this, Mm -hmm. and then in the center where the seatbelts are, there's a big hole. Mm -hmm. And when shit goes down there, you have to go in the back seat to get it. Mm -hmm. So my phone slid down there and behind. So I I stopped and got the gas, I had to open the door reach back there and grab my phone. Since he couldn't take care of Jeannie's lawn like they planned, they just talked for a while, trying to wait out the rain, and then Jeff left after about an hour or so. He isn't sure, but he knows that he called his dad right after he left, and he texted Anna the message, here, when he arrived at Applebee's, so sometime between then. Anna told him he should head to Applebee's, and his plan was to go home and change first, because he was soaking wet from being in the rain on the side of the road, but he couldn't get into the house. Stoltz clarifies again. Whose idea was it to go to Applebee's? And whose idea was it to go to Applebee's? Anna's. For us to meet there. Who's us? Uh, me and Bruce. Because he was at the wreck. I think he was just going to go home afterwards, but she said to everyone go up to Applebee's. She was expecting us to go up there originally. And who, who told Bruce to go there? Anna. And how did she do that? Did she call him, text I, him? I don't know. She probably texted or called him. You'd have to ask her that or arrest him. Okay. Did you call Bruce at all or did he call you? Uh, yeah, we spoke a few times when I was trying to figure out where Mel was. Because I tried to get back in the house to change and take a shower because I was kind of stinky. We were all trying to get a hold of Mel, so we all like crisscross called each other trying to figure out where so she was. So you guys were calling each other, you and Bruce? Yeah, I called him a few times. He called me once, saying that he was at the wreck, because I asked where he was. I thought they would be together. But, and then Anna called him a few times. She called me a few times, I think. We were all just calling each other, trying to figure out what was going on. Jeff got to Applebee's and said he waited for about 30 to 40 minutes until Bruce got there after the rec center. Stoltz breaks to ask him about his clothes, if the ones he was wearing are the ones they have in their possession. He says the ones he was wearing before three are in the house, and the ones he was wearing after he left the house have been handed over. They're welcome to take the ones at the house, Jeff offers. Back to Applebee's, Bruce comes in, they eat, he talks about Walmart, Kyle, and what happened to his tire that morning. Bruce was pissy, according to Jeff, not super thrilled that Mel had told him to go to Brew Kettle and then stood him up. They mentioned spaz, they speculated about neighbors, and between that, they took turns trying to call Mel and figure out where she was. By the time the food was done, Bruce gave up and was anxious to head home. Jeff is rubbing the back of his neck while he talks about them leaving. He put some more gas in his car because he'd noticed the light was on again. Bruce drove off before him, and then Jeff left soon after. Until this point, Jeff has been using his hands in animated ways to display streets, houses, locations of places and directions he took. But now he's doing so with his hands in his pockets. 
He's moving them back and forth, describing the way he took to get home, but you can't see what his fingers are doing because they're in his pockets. Stoltz is most likely asking Jeff about his route home so specifically, because Bruce had mentioned that even though Jeff left first, he got there after him. Almost as if he wanted to make sure that Bruce was the first one to walk in. Then he describes coming home to find his future mother-in-law, murdered in the kitchen. It gets confusing, because Stoltz doesn't understand the amount of time it takes for Jeff to notice what's happened. When Jeff hears Bruce scream, he says his first thought is that something is wrong with the baby, picks up her carrier, and examines her. But after an entire day of looking for Mel, Stoltz is trying to make sense of that. While Jeff gives an explanation, he's begun swinging back and forth in the computer chair he's sitting in. Jeff is self-soothing. You know, Kyle opened the door, the lights were all on, nothing seemed out of place, just looking in. I reached in, put the baby to the right like I always do, because the one door doesn't open, so I always put her to the right. And I went back out, grabbed her bag, grabbed my phone, wallet, and I walked in. And then when I was walking back, like, about to round the garage, Bruce started screaming about something. I ran in. Kyle picked up the baby and moved her in the living room, the room with the TV, where the couch was, the L couch. Um, he put him in there, so I walked in and ran over so to the baby. So you put the baby right in the foyer right there, to the right, by the stairs? Yeah, right where the base of the stairs was. And Kyle picked up the baby. He does this all the time. He picks her up and he puts her in the other room, because that's where everyone hangs out. Picked him up right in there. I thought something was wrong with the baby, so I ran you, in. You went outside to get the diaper bag and do what else? Oh, uh, my keys and wallet. I left them on the seat because I didn't know if we were going to get in the house. Keys, wallet, and phone were all right on the driver's seat. And I didn't want to leave the baby there because she was awake, so she would have started screaming if we left away. And then you heard him, uh, you heard Bruce, what did Bruce scream? I don't know what he screamed at first. I just kind of heard him yell. So I ran in, I thought something was wrong with the baby. Didn't see her at the door, was yelling, where's the baby, where's the baby? Look, ran into the kitchen, saw her to the right, ran over there, looked at her, nothing was wrong. He was screaming in the kitchen. I thought something was wrong. I turned around, and Mel was laying down. So you, you went in, you went to the right for the baby? You didn't look? Well, Is that what you said? I looked, but I didn't see. You know, I just looked for the little carrier, because I was afraid something was wrong with her. Where's Bruce standing when, when you come in the house? Uh, right above her head. Like to the right. Like if you're, if this is the pantry door, he was standing like this. I didn't even realize she was there at first. Did you actually go into the living room? Yes, I went in the living room. I picked up the carrier and I'm looking at her face. I thought something was wrong. And then I turned around and saw her in there and then he started screaming, she's bleeding, she's bleeding, she's bleeding. And I was like, call 911, call 911, call 911. And I reached down and I touched her leg to see if, you know, if she was a white guy, like shook her leg. She didn't move. So he was standing over her now? Yeah, like uh, right where her head is, her head was. And then I shook her leg and she didn't move. Uh, he He's yelling, she's bleeding? He's yelling, she's bleeding, she's bleeding, she's bleeding. Then he ran past me into the front room and he started digging in his bags, looking for his phone. And he yelled, he can't find his phone, he can't find his phone. And then he ran back over and like did something to her. He was looking, touching her or moved her or something. Like yeah, I think he just touched her back and realized she was bleeding from, from all over her back or whatever. I pulled out my phone and started calling and then he yelled, she isn't breathing. And that's when I grabbed Kyle and walked out. Kyle didn't want to go out. I kind of dragged him out by his neck. I wasn't trying to hurt him, but I just didn't want him in there. Did you call 911? I did. I think he called as well, but I'm not sure. Were you outside when you called 911? Yes. I ran straight out to the truck. It was rain when I was making my way to the truck. Put the baby carrier in. I forced Kyle to sit down. Uh, when I was on the phone with 911, I turned on the lights and looked to see if Kyle was bleeding or anything because the lady asked me. And Bruce went to his bags to try to find his phone? He was looking through his bags. And then he came out, he was on the phone. I think he was on the phone with 911. He was yelling into the phone, so I don't know. I was trying to answer the lady's questions. Stoltz asked Jeff about the cameras, since he's the one who installed them. The cameras don't sound like they've helped at all, though. 
since the app connected to Mel's phone never seems to connect to the feed when it actually matters, and the cords would be randomly cut. And as far as any weapons go in the house, Jeff tells him about the guns and knives and offers that they can all be tested. He doesn't normally have guns in the house, but he picked up a bag of five from his father on Sunday. They were heading to a gun show, but his father ended up with a massive hand infection out of nowhere, and Jeff took the NRA gun bag and put them in the house. There were also a couple hunting knives as well. He didn't have a chance to stop over at his father's house to put them there, and he didn't want to drive around with them. None of them have been fired, though. You can test them, Jeff says. Since he's the only person who seems to actively fire guns, Stoltz wants to clarify the last time he shot a weapon and where. Jeff says it's been a while, at least two or three months, but he has handled a weapon that his father has shot recently, so he's been worried about GSR testing. Gun residue is a consistency similar to flour and stays on the hands of a living person for up to six hours. Wiping your hands and touching anything will result in transfer, and it can also be washed off. The gun that had been fired, however, isn't in the bag. It's at his father's house. He cleared it, emptied the chamber, and set it back in his bag because his mother doesn't know how to do any of that stuff. Stoltz is again confused by this logic, but through the loop-de-loops of his story, eventually they come to some sort of understanding. Which is good, because Jeff is worried. Nothing that I would have. What time on Saturday did you do that? Uh, early morning, 10, 11. And where did you do that at? Uh, the hospital parking lot. In front of my mother. She doesn't know how to do any of that stuff. And I didn't want her driving around with a gun like that. And I do handle guns with my father whenever we do, do stuff like that. He says to me, this sells okay. Jeff, but you have, you said you're afraid to drive around with those guns. Um, you, the other ones, you, you took inside, and then why would this one, why would you not take this one inside as well? My mother drove his car home. Okay. It was, it was in a black bag in his truck. I was driving my envoy there. I stopped by to see him that day. I went out to the car with them because she was going to give me money for LEC to point past that day. They went out to Cedar Point. I just cleared the weapon, set it inside the bag, and she took the bag home. I just didn't want her picking up the bag and, you know, setting it down. And God forbid something happened. She took what bag home? My father's bag. It had his concealed carrier weapon in it. I just wanted to clear it just in case she threw it down or something. But why would she take the other bag home then? The other bag. I wasn't driving. That was the truck. It was in the back of the truck. So when I went and grabbed the truck that one day, I didn't like that later that day, I did not know that that bag was in there until I got home. You didn't know that the 9 layer was in there? You didn't know that? No, not the... The NRA bag with all the guns in it right. was in the truck. The bag that... The gun that had a loaded gun in it was in my dad's truck, his SUV. My mom drove the SUV home. I drove Ellie around a little bit more. Went home, grabbed the truck, left the envoy there, the truck that just had the NRA bag in it, and drove to my house. Because I planned to do work at my aunt's, which I ended up not doing that day, and ended up going to do it today. I did not intentionally take those guns, basically, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry if I'm not explaining things well, I'm very tired. Does that make sense, sir? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit further about it. So let me, let's just back up so I understand this clearly. We'll go slow because you're throwing a lot of cars out there. And So okay. on Saturday, yes, you guys were planning on going. They were, they were going to see... Let me start again. Saturday, Ellie's in the car. Ellie's... I'm going to pick up Ellie. I stop at the hospital to say hi to my dad. I haven't seen him since he's been in the hospital. His truck is in the parking lot. He said that there was a gun in there and that I can go grab some money. My mother walked out there with me. She grabbed the money out of the bag and gave me some money for Ellie's ticket. I cleared the weapon that was in his car so that there was nothing in the chamber or anything like that. He's licensed to carry it. He's a concealed carry weapon. Okay. I checked your, the magazine. And your mom takes that? Yes, and I okay. put it in the back seat of the car, like all the way in the back, you know, where you open up the window. I set it down there. She drove off in that car later. She went back up. 
But I went in my car, drove, picked up Ellie, went to Rite Aid, bought her ticket, and then we went back to the house and they went to Cedar Point. So the last time you physically touched a gun was Saturday, right? Yes. Okay. But I don't know when the last time he fired that weapon was. That's what I was worried about. Yeah. And since Saturday, have you showered? Yes. I think I showered that day. I don't know if I showered yesterday, though. I'm sorry to say. Okay. But you showered? Yes. Okay. And do you wash your hands after you use the restroom? Yes. I'm not in trouble. No, I just, I'm sorry, you know, you're, stressed you're, no, you're asking me, you know, you're worried about it, but, um, you know, if the last time you touched a gun was 40 hours ago at the least, you showered, you washed your hands, you know, so you should so have to worry about All right. Oh, thank God I was worried. I didn't know how long that stuff stayed on. Stoltz once again brings it back to the timeline between leaving the house and getting to Aunt Jeannie's. Jeff continues to sigh heavily, rubbing the back of his neck, rearranging his shirt. He's almost annoyed with the unexplainable gap in time, holding his hands open as if to say, hey, I don't really know. Up until now, Jeff has most likely always been able to wear people out with excuse after excuse. But this conversation isn't going away until Stoltz gets a clear picture of what happened and when because what he's telling him just doesn't make sense. Jeff, let's go back to when your car breaks down. It's just an awfully long time to be on Drake Road for an hour and a half. And so when you say... Was, was I there for an hour? I wasn't there for an hour and a half. I was there less than that. But I was just... You know how when you pull the side of the road a little bit and there's the ditch? I was just outside the ditch. I had my hazard lights on. It was when the pouring rain started. I was just, like, I could see the corner of the gas station, at the top corner of the gas station. But you're there You're there for an hour. You, you said you were there for an hour and a half. That's bad, I guess. So, really long time, and then, then you tell me you can't find your phone. I didn't have my phone. I didn't know where it was. You said you couldn't find it. I know, but I'm, I'm saying okay. like I didn't physically have it. Okay, but phones. you could get it. You just got to go to the back, you said, and, and grab it. Yeah, but I didn't know if I left it at the house or what. Like, I was looking, and then when I finally, like, when the nice man got me some gas, and I got to the gas station, I started, sat down, looked, you know, looked in the car, looked everywhere, opened the back door, reached back, looked through all that. How long were you sitting there before that guy came and helped you? Maybe 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. 20, 30 minutes? Yeah. And no more than 20, 30 minutes, did you want to go see if you left your phone? at the house or go to check the car? I didn't have gas. You know, no. What I'm asking, though, is, I, I said it wrong, in that 20 to 30 minutes, you didn't want to check your car to see if you left the I phone at the I looked around, but I didn't want to hop out on Drake and open up old doors with cars. But even them. describing those seats, knowing that it drops down there and where it ends up, would be pretty... I mean, I looked around, I didn't see it. Like, the way... I guess I could have done it better. I was just looking around for the phone. I just didn't I mean, see it. Especially now that you have you have help, and then you look for your phone. Uh, it just seems like an awfully long time to be sitting there in Drake Road. Um, there's a big gap in time. I don't know. I didn't um, want to hop out of the car with people zooming by me, and I didn't want to walk out and try and walk to the gas station holding a gas tank and the baby. That's what was my predicament. I understand not getting, not wanting to get out of the car with the baby, and if it's raining, but um, I think anybody would first look for their phone to see if they call for some help. Well, I was looking, but like I said, you have to get around the back, and I just... Didn't feel safe to do that? I didn't feel safe to do it, and I... There's a good possibility I left the phone at home is what I was thinking. But what made you feel safe 20 or 30 minutes later? I what? pulled up into the get-go. Mm -hmm. After I got some gas, I pulled up into the get-go. Hey, but you just told me that you found it while he was getting you gas. Yeah, he got me gas. I pulled up into the get-go. I said I'd put $6 in the tank. That's when I opened up the car and looked up on the phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I called Jeannie. Or I might have texted Jeannie or called Jeannie that I was on the way.
Understandably, it's been a long day. No doubt everyone was tired. Bruce hadn't even slept, and both Anna and Megan had just lost their mother. But none of them mentioned once during their interviews with Stoltz that they were tired. Jeff, however, is exhausted. He's having trouble recalling information, he's getting mixed up, and he's feeling flustered. It's almost like he wants to give Stoltz a good reason why. I'm sorry, I'm a little tired too. I think I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really tired. I'm sorry, I'm really fucking tired. I'm sorry if I'm not explaining things well, I'm very really tired. I'm sorry if I'm not explaining things right, I'm very tired. As he takes a swig of water, Detective Stoltz is playing up a more confrontational role now and begins to ask Jeff another question he's not prepared for. As is Jeff's habit, he explains it away with excuses and stories that may have been good enough for his family to be, but they're not good enough for Stoltz. Something that Jeff has done throughout the interview is constantly remind Stoltz that he can test this, search for this, check on this, and most importantly, verify with this person. It was there, you can ask Anna. I did this, you can ask my mom. Anyone can tell from the outside looking in that Jeff is a liar. Not just one or two lies here and there, but full stories dependent on other full stories, a card house of fiction. He speaks in vague fragments. His voice even sounds uncertain as he answers questions. Bruce had told Stoltz that Jeff is the kind of guy who always had a tall tale. Excuse after excuse after excuse, and you just get to the point where you don't even bother. Jeff didn't keep people in his life that challenged him in any way, but Stoltz wasn't a bridge he could burn, and Jeff can't think fast enough. At one point, he even tells Stoltz that he can ask Melinda to prove his story is true, and then lets out a hmm and keeps going. But referring Stoltz to someone else to answer these questions won't get Jeff out of this. Jeff needs to fill in the blanks himself. Jeff, how did you get the scratches on your face? I had a little bumper with the truck. I got tapped. That's from me hitting the steering wheel. You can ask Anna and her mother about, and her father and whoever else. When did you get a car accident? <clears throat> it wasn't really a car accident, it was just kind of a bump. Okay. Well, when did you get bumped? Yesterday. Uh, I was helping my buddy move from his house here in Prospect. He can account from where I was there. And then on the way back, I got bumped, but just enough to just hit my head. And I've had the scratches since yesterday. You can ask Anna or Bruce about it. Okay. Would you hit your head on the steering wheel? Mm-hmm. It was just enough of a bump. Did you, was there a police report? No. There was no damage on either of the cars. It's just the seam of the, the, seam of the wheel sticks out, and that's what cut me. This side, I don't know what that is. This is what hit me. Yeah, what is on this side? So you hit a that was round, so these are going down. They scratch marks. I don't think so. It was there last night. It's just from something else. It could be from the Selby unit. But this all was there last night. You can ask Anna, Bruce, all of them. And if you need to, I guess you can test my face. <laughs> I don't know if that's an actual thing. When Stoltz asks him who he thinks is capable of doing something like this, Interestingly enough, Jeff starts from those closest to him. He says Bruce's name, then starts rubbing his face. I don't think Anna would. I don't think Meg would. The casualty of his statements, the words he chooses. These are the people he lives with. His fiance. He's offering their names first, isn't even crossing them out with certainty, and then swerves into other sideshow possibilities. He starts rambling about some neighbor it could be, and then tries to find the card for the police officer he told that to at the scene. Again, says to Stoltz, you can call Anna and ask her about it if you want. Jeff seems very used to the concept that his word doesn't count for very much. So who do you think is capable of doing something like this? I mean, Bruce gets angry and yells at everybody sometimes, but I don't think he would be able to do that. I don't, I don't think Anna would. I don't think anybody would. Anna and Mel recently found out that the guy next door has guns and was flaunting guns around. He said something about it when the break-in happened to the officer. He said he was like, oh, detective. Uh, I don't know what he is. I don't know how they came about that. They told the detective that came by. He had white hair, kind of short. I don't know his name. I have his card. Actually, look. I do have his card. Stoltz asks Jeff, in the process of eliminating people that were on the scene, would he be willing to take a lie detector test? This, of course, isn't to eliminate Jeff. 
It's because he's a person of interest. Jeff says yes, then says, well, he'll have to ask his mother first, but he thought those things didn't work. Stoltz assures him that they do. Not every state uses polygraphs, and the results are often not admissible in court because that requires approval from both sides. But they're useful tools when it comes to initially getting more information out of a suspect. They aren't foolproof, but it doesn't really matter if the person of interest knows that, just as long as they think the information that comes from the test is reliable. As they're wrapping up, Stoltz once again asks him if he has any knowledge of what happened, and also asks him if he had anything to do with it. Jeff says no, she's a nice lady, everyone likes her, she's a teacher. Again, he brings up Bruce. But Jeff is bringing up answers that sound like good enough answers. Deep down, he knows he's not handing over any valuable information. He crosses his arms and sighs as Stoltz brings up the strangeness of him not acknowledging Bruce when he screamed, and instead going over to examine the baby. This hour and a half is probably the longest that Jeff has had to face his own lack of logic in a while. It, you know, it seems odd to me is when you heard Bruce screaming. So you said initially you were afraid it's the baby, yeah. but you long ago you'd come in, you'd go to the scream, so you're looking for Bruce, number one. And then well, it's more really with the baby because cows. Well, you're assuming that you're wondering if it's the baby, and you're gonna. And Bruce is screaming, so he must see something. With he the just baby. screamed once. He wasn't constantly screaming. Okay. That's what you're to say. So he screamed. Yes. You're worried about the baby, so you're going to go to Bruce because you're assuming the baby's by him, right? That's well, why he'd be screaming. I was just looking for the carrier. I set her down inside, and when I looked in the door and she wasn't there, I really thought it was about her. Why he was yelling? Yeah, I, I, it's it's just hard to believe that you would see him standing there and see a scene like that. You know, you said you went right to the, the room and... I was just looking for the baby, I guess. You know, because it's not a very big house. So, I mean, when you come into that, out of that hallway there, you could see Bruce real easily, you know. So, you couldn't pass him up. I was just looking for the baby. That's all I got to say, I guess. I just, I wanted to make sure my daughter was safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just it seems really tough to run by that. I wasn't, I'm not trying to ignore her, well, that's what you're trying to say. you know, he screamed once, so what did he scream? Like, what was he saying? I was out, I don't know, it was loud and it was scary. I ran in to see what it was. Was it high pitched, like a high pitched scream, or? It's like, ah, like real loud, he yelled something, like help, or it's just something short like and that. And that panicked you that much to run in the house and look for the baby? Well, I just set her down, and Kyle has hit her a few times, so I got scared, yes. When I reached, when I walked right in, set her down, walked out, heard him yell, walk in, the baby's not there. The first thing I think of was, where's the baby? Why is the baby not there? What's wrong? And so you physically ran? Or did well, you walk in? Like, walked really fast. I didn't run, run. If that's what you're thinking. And didn't see Bruce. Well, I looked, and I... Just was looking for the baby. That's all I wanted to know, where the baby was, why the baby wasn't where she was. That's all I was really concerned about. Hmm. Well, if I heard somebody yell, if I heard you yell, I'd be looking for you. Even if I thought it was about the baby, I'd be looking for you, assuming that you saw something or, hey, what do you, what's wrong? So it's just really odd to me that you don't even see Bruce and he's the one that yelled and he wasn't screaming like you said, like... He just screamed, he just yelled once, like, ah, you know, so that's not really that scary. So you go in, you don't run in, so it's not like you ran in and flew by him. You, you fast-paced walk, and then you just don't even see him. You you just dismiss him and go to the right. You see him, but you don't see the rest. I was just looking for the baby, I guess. I don't know. I right, but you see him, but you don't see everything else, and you went to the right. So how do you, just, how like, do you see it. him and not look down? I just like wasn't like paying attention. I don't know. I was looking for the baby. All I wanted to see was the baby. What was wrong? What was going on? There's, the there's no way, Jeff. There's no way you could see him, see that he's there, and then and go to the right without seeing Mel. There's no way, especially in a small kitchen like that. I don't know. I just didn't. I don't know what you want me to say. Oh, well, it's just not believable. This is impossible to to walk in that house to look over and see Bruce. The guy that yelled, and 
not to be like, what's wrong? And then there's no way you can miss that. I mean, there's no way you can miss that. I guess. I don't know. I just, all I wanted was the baby. I just wanted her to figure out what was wrong. Reaching, like, reaching in, setting her down, and walking out, and then coming back after you hear someone yell and she's not there, that's kind of scary. I wanted to see where the hell she was, what was going on. Once I figured out where she was, I looked around, Mel was there, Kyle was right next to me. That's when we were talking about the 911, called 911, he went to his bags. I just didn't register it, I guess, I don't know. Well, when did you see Mel? Kind of when I turned around, I noticed she was there. Turned around from the family room? Yeah, I reached down, picked up the baby's carcass, looked at it, and I turned around. Kind of like where is that? Where is the baby carrier? Uh, you know where the second chair was, of the thing. It was right on the edge, like nearly in the family room, nearly not in the family room. That's Technically in the family room, but not, like still on the tile, kind of. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, it just it just seems really hard to miss that, you know, especially when, especially when you say you saw him, but you don't see her. It's just it's, it's impossible. I'm not looking at the floor. I wasn't really trying. To, I don't know. You can't you can't look in that room without seeing the floor. I don't know. I just was. I don't know. I just wanted to see where Aurora was. That was like my main objective, I guess. Stoltz is about to let Jeff go for now, but he tells him that he's definitely having a hard time with some aspects of his story. Jeff swallows deeply and sighs. What part are you having trouble with, sir? He doesn't want to be asking this, but he knows that's what someone should do in this case. Stoltz says that he just thinks that it's a really long time for him to be on that road, along with some other aspects. Jeff basically says he doesn't know what to tell him. He's given him all the information he can. And with that, they're done. Stoltz says he'll walk him out, and Jeff asks, Do you have any more questions about my story? Stoltz says no, and Jeff says, Well, I'm sorry which is another interesting reply. He isn't angry. He isn't scared. He isn't thankful that the police are on the case. He's apologizing because the only thing Jeff feels is guilt. Bruce, Anna, and Jeff would all speak to the police a second time. It's been almost two days since his first one. It's common for traumatic and chaotic events to spin the mind dizzy with details. Police aren't surprised when new information or ideas surface for people a day or two later. Stoltz also has some things that he needs to clear up about Jeff's first interview. While it takes time to collect evidence like forensic testing and gathering surveillance footage, it's best to also get first-hand accounts to clear up any contradictions, and Jeff's timeline is full of them. This time Jeff is in a sweater, and as Stoltz is reminding him that he's not in any trouble and he's free to leave whenever he wants, Jeff remarks about how it's even colder in there than last time. Stoltz jokes and says he's always cold too, that's why he's wearing a jacket. Interrogation rooms aren't a place where authorities want anyone else to be comfortable or in command besides them. They're often only big enough for three to four people, kept plain, very cold, without much furniture or any windows so that there's no distractions. Stoltz starts off by asking Jeff if there's anything he thought of since they last spoke. Jeff refers back to the attempted break-in that happened when he was about to let Moose into the backyard. When he's not demonstrating the size or location of things with his hands, Jeff spends much of his time with his arms crossed, looking down at the ground. These burglars were gutsy. In broad daylight, just as he approached the sliding glass door, he noticed a guy trying to break in. They had a bit of a tug of war with the door, and then he ran off. Jeff spends the first 15 minutes of the interview describing the event and the man. Even though the whole thing was just seconds long, Jeff saw his hands and what he was wearing black track pants with white mesh stripes on the side, and a blue Hollister hoodie with numbers under the brand name. Whoever that guy was, that's the guy who most likely killed Melinda. He reminds Stoltz that all of this is documented in a police report that he made right after it happened. When Stoltz says that he'd like to go back to the day of Melinda's murder again, Jeffrey sighs heavily with a groan and sits back abruptly in his seat. No doubt it's a tragic and hard thing to talk about, but he seems more annoyed than anything else. Touch on why uh, it came up. Um, let's just go to the day of again and, um, and see if anything uh, stands out. Um, just start start from the beginning. You know, I, I, I woke up. I know you woke up. 
Jeff usually stays up until early morning hours playing video games. Anna wakes him when she's ready to leave for work so he can take over watching the baby. He makes them lunch, describes it in detail, takes out some of her toys, describes those in detail, and then they watch Barney on the couch together. Mel got home, except this time Jeff explains a little more of their conversation when that happened. Although at points, Stoltz finds it difficult to keep up with his details. He hops back and forth between the day of to the day before Melinda's murder. He also tends to include new information each time he tells his story. Nailing down a timeline shouldn't be this hard. It's almost as hard as Jeff trying to pay for his own wedding, and that didn't happen either. He just has the worst luck. He gets caught in the rain, he runs out of gas, he misses business hours, he gets into car accidents. It never ends. Her kitchen set. I pulled out her box of kitchen set stuff, the metal stuff. She's playing, watching TV. Yeah. And then Mel came home. I couldn't tell you the exact time she came home. I was kind of just chilling on the couch, playing on the phone, watching her play. You remember exactly, uh, not exactly, but a kind of an estimate? <sighs> maybe an hour after that, maybe an hour and a half. Maybe a new, so 12, 12, 30? 12, 12, 30, okay. maybe around there. Okay. Um, uh-huh. She came home. She said uh, they paid for the wedding because I couldn't get all the money together. Who's they? Uh, Mel, and Bruce? Uh, Mel. Mel and Bruce or Mel. I don't know exactly who. I okay. wasn't there. I uh, couldn't get all the money together at the time. Okay. It was a big stressful thing leading up to that. What What happened? What were you supposed to pay part of it? I was I was gonna I wanted to pay all of it. I didn't have all the money. Okay. Couldn't get all the money. How much was the wedding? I think it was like six thousand three hundred, six thousand four hundred. There's paperwork at the house. I can go get it if you want. Okay. All right, and you were supposed to pay, you wanted to pay for all of your pay part I of wanted it. to pay for all of it. What, what happened with that? What do you mean you wanted? What? I just did? wanted to pay for all of it. They offered to a few times, but I didn't want to do it because that's just the whole thing. You know, you owe people money. And mm-hmm. But why, so what happened that you weren't able to? You said stressful things. Well, I didn't have enough of my savings account straight off the bat. Yeah. So I was going to go cancel my IRA just to pull it out and then pay the tax at the end of the year. Since I didn't have, since I'm currently unemployed and everything. So you, know, could, you could start pulling your IRA, huh? Yeah, and that's what the plan was going to be, but I didn't make it there in time. So I asked, what do you mean? I didn't get to the place and schedule an appointment in time. I sent, I called once and asked what would the repercussions of it would be and everything. Yeah, penalties. Yeah. And there's How much do you have in your IRA? There. Uh, $5,000. Okay. Not that much. Not as much as it should have been, basically. So, you decided not to do the IRA? No, I was, going, I was going to. I was going to do it and then just pay the tax later on because I'm, you know, I figure I'll have a job before then. So you're going to, but um, you missed some deadline or it just ran close to the It just to ran too close to the time. To the way yeah, I helped. I helped Dakota move and everything. Did I give you his number? You know, you have my phone, don't you? Yeah, I have your phone, yeah. And his number's in there. You can call him about it. I don't know who Dakota is. He's one of our friends. I helped him move. What What am I calling him for, or do you call him? If you need to. About what? I'm not sure. Uh, I helped him move oh. before then. I helped him move right after there, and then while they were paying with it, I was with him moving, and then I got home. Around eight-ish. Okay. Um, and that's when I got bumped and got this on the way to his house. Okay. He has a house, you know, um, you know when you go to the industrial oh, park? Hold on. I'm just sorry. having a tough time keeping up. I'm sorry. I don't to talk too much. That's okay. No, I mean, I'm listening, but just trying to, um, you're going to you're gonna do it, but I got too close to the wedding. No, so I, got to, I just didn't get there in time. They closed at like 2.30. What, what day are you talking about? Are you talking about Monday? No, Sunday, the day before that. The day before she was killed. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then you lost me because you jumped from Monday. I'm sorry. I'm, so I'm just trying to establish a timeline and then you jump back to Sunday. <laughs> so, I mean, you're going to pull your RA on Sunday? Yes. And then they closed? They weren't open that day, I believe. So I was trying to figure it out how to do it. I was going to ask my mom to get the money out and then we pay her back tomorrow. Where, where is it? Where it's just at Scott Trade. 
Okay, so you're going to, but close on Sunday. Stoltz asks about the location of where his little bump of a car accident took place. It was right after some train tracks. He was trying to slow down, and the car behind him tapped him. But again, just like when he ran out of gas, the guy who tapped him got out to make sure he was okay and was super nice. Jeff switches between crossed arms and rubbing his eyes, mostly watching Stoltz write down details and not making eye contact. Like I said, I got into a hit and run not too long ago. I actually might have the card from that. Jeff pulls out his wallet, looks at a card or two, shrugs, and puts it back in his pocket. It isn't even clear what accident he's talking about or what the card would be from. But Stoltz isn't letting him stray this time. He's barely got a timeline out of him from the first interview, and he's here to get solid answers. Even if Jeff didn't make a report about the accident himself, they would have other ways to check. Stoltz is surprised. This tap was hard enough for Jeff to hit his head off of the steering wheel, hard enough to scratch his face up. But Jeff says he didn't need to make a report because there was no damage to the car and it wasn't that bad. And the airbags didn't deploy because they'd been turned off for a while. This time when he mentions going to Applebee's, it isn't Anna's idea, it's Mel's. He also mentions that nothing about it was really organized. His mother didn't know about the dinner either. In this version, it was Mel's idea to invite his mother. However, Jeff had organized the dinner, according to Bruce, and told everyone that his mother didn't trust him with the money, so she'd be paying Mel back for the wedding fees at Applebee's herself. But now Jeff says that he was just going to show up to get his mother and surprise her with the whole thing. Even getting the money was never confirmed. So it was Mel's idea to go to Applebee's, and also Mel's idea to cancel it last minute. And the only person she told any of this to was Jeff. We were gonna... We were gonna all meet for lunch. No, not lunch, dinner. And we were going to go to Applebee's, and then we were all meeting there. Who's who's all? Me, Mel... Bruce, Anna's going to be serving us, Kyle's going to be there, and then she asked if my mom could be there, because I talked about trying to get them all together. Did you say Megan? No, Megan, I think Megan was at school. Was she? Yeah, Bruce, she Kyle, talked. Mel, Bruce. She was there the night before for a bit, but I only talked to her for a minute. I'm okay. sure she left that early. That and your mom? I was going to try and get my mom over there, yes. And... This, are you telling me this is a conversation you're having while Mel's home? No, this was all stuff we talked about the night before, but then she said she didn't want to do it. She had other stuff to do. And then she said she was going to the doctor for something with her foot. When, when did Mel cancel on you? Right when she walked in the door, she's like, hey, I have other stuff to do today. We're not going to dinner. And I was like, okay. Okay. Whatever. And you let your mom know? No. You just, you I was going to surprise my mom and pick her up because it's hard to get a hold of her with stuff. I'm surprised what do you mean? No, I can't. Sold, so you're still going to go to dinner with her? I was going to go to dinner either way to see him with the baby. With your mom? No, with the baby. I wasn't even going to pick up my mom if this should, if she's not going, my Mel's. Yeah, but uh, so I, as I asked you, did you call your mom and tell her that we're not meeting? And you said, no, I'm going to No, I was going you. to surprise my mother with the whole thing. Oh, she gets home right at like 5.30. I was going to go over there, pick her up, and then come back. But since he canceled, that is an instance he need. Okay, so your mom doesn't know about this meeting? No. No? I mean, she might have, unless I messaged it on the phone. Is that a problem? Or? No, no, Jeff, no, you just... I'm sorry. Baby, I'm... Yeah, you're, you're just just trying to be on the same page as you. You know, when you said we're, you're going to meet and your mom and then... Then you said Mel canceled. I understand that. And then I, that's I asked did you tell your mom that it was canceled. You just, then you just wanted to know I was going to surprise her. No, I was going to. Surprise so she doesn't know about the dinner. No, but I, I did ask her for money. I didn't tell her about the dinner dinner because I wanted them to get together. Because every time I try so to get them together, one party or the other party either has stuff. Okay, so you're going to show up there to get money from her and then say, hey, we're going to dinner. Mm-hmm. Okay. And are you borrowing money for the wedding? Mm-hmm. I was okay. going to borrow a little bit of money from her mother, yes. How much did you need to borrow from her? 1600 but it was never like confirmed, confirmed with her. Again, they reach the point in Jeff's day when he runs out of gas on the side of the road. Jeff seems to think that the longer he can talk about the time frame, the more actual time in his day it will fill up. But Stoltz isn't distracted with useless details. His description of the man sounds cartoonish. Jeff rubs his neck, plays with his collar, rubs his eyes, and avoids eye contact. At one point, when he's describing this helpless situation that he was in, he says he was thinking, What am I going to do? What am I going to do? 
I wasn't thinking well. That part is true. Jeff was thinking that on the side of the road, but it wasn't about gas. You can tell he's feeling some sort of internal conflict, almost as if he's walking himself through this story carefully so that his dialogue is sensical. And when we talked, you said a good Samaritan came by? Yes. Okay. Um, old, how, how long were you there till he came? Because, I mean, now it's just you go after three. Not too long. How long did you have to wait? Maybe, maybe 30 minutes, like around that, until he came. You know, I was... Can you, who came to you, who was it? What it was, uh, just an older man who asked if I needed help, and I said yes, I needed help. An old guy, he had a red Buick. Red Buick? Yeah, okay. And so who did you pull behind you? He pulled right behind me. You know, I had hazards on and everything. Okay. And he walked up to the window. Okay. And I just opened the door and talked to him. All right, then would you, uh... I said I, I ran out of gas, I didn't even realize, you know. He talked to me for a second, he asked if I wanted to, if he could go fill up the tanks and everything, because he saw I had the baby. Okay. And I gave him $10 to put in there. I gave him one of the tanks, I figured the worst case is he's going to steal, you know, my 10 bucks and tank, and that'll be the end of it. Whatever. He came back, thank God, and just... And Wait, the are the tanks are they, are they the same? Are they the same? What are they look like? Five gallon tanks. You yeah. know, like you go to the gas station. Exact same there. same tanks. So you took one of them. Uh, no, they're not the exact same model. Like the exact same kind. If that's what you're talking about, they're the same yeah. carry. Like they hold the same amount. Okay. One is. Do you know which one you took? Yeah, the the one with the yellow nozzle, the all red one. Oh, it's red. Yeah, they're both red, but uh, there's one with a yellow nozzle and a black top, and then there's another one with a black and red. A nozzle and a black top. And the other one's like more square. Okay. And how long does it take him to get there and get back? Not too you, long. Like, I remember you saying you could see Gecko. I could see the corner of the sign, so I was thinking, like, in my head, you know, if I have to stay here too much longer, if I can't find the phone, I'll, I'll go get an umbrella out of the back of the car and, you know, hold the baby like this and hold the can like this and just walk and then walk back. That, that's what I was trying to think, but with cars going around me and you know, it rained like that, and the baby getting upset that she yeah. wasn't moving. Yeah, yeah. No. It was just all kind of like, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? I wasn't thinking that well, I guess. Yeah. Um, and how long did it take him to get back? I honestly time. couldn't tell you. I was more relieved that someone actually stopped. I mean, it wasn't long, though. No, it wasn't that long. Okay. All right. And then that was, like, nearly all the cash I had on me. I think I had, like, five by five, and then I reached the cup holder and grabbed some change. And then Anna's one friend, Daryl, was at the counter. You had a $5 bill on you? Yeah. Okay. After that, I gave him 10 I don't know if he, you know, put it all in, but whatever. I would, I didn't care. And then, um, <coughs> so after he, do you fill up the gas, or does he fill up your gas for you? He put it in the tank. Oh, he did? Okay. Yeah. You poured, I didn't, I told him not to pour all of it in, because I was going to go up to the thing. He was very nice. You know, old man wearing tweed, glasses, little floppy hat, like the golf hat. Okay. You see, nice. Uh, what did you say before the golf hat? Well, what, you, you know, know like, you know, you look on the, the golf shows and they got the, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, like a fedora? It's not a fedora, but like, you know, the flat version of a fedora where it like, it doesn't cover your ears, it's just like the, the hair. It's basically, you know, hold your hair up or whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not trying to be undescriptive or anything. No, 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 you look like a like a professor almost, like you know, yeah. like, you know how you imagine a college professor yeah. in your head. Okay. okay, so you got you had to find some change and you go fill up. I pulled in to the, one of the pumps on the left, and I can say he gets to Genie's, has a bowl of soup. He stayed there for a while, and then he went home to change because he was, according to him, covered in rain. He reminds Stoltz, like he did during his first interview, that he can verify this with his aunt. But if he was so drenched, he could have also waited for Bruce to stop by on the way to Applebee's. Bruce and Mel both had keys to the front door. It's surprising that Jeff stresses how much he was covered in water, even though it sounds like he barely got out of the car besides to give the man his gas tank. He didn't even fill the tank himself. How long could he have possibly stood in the rain for? In Jeff's first story, it wasn't raining when he headed over to Jeannie's with full intentions to do yard work. But now, it had been pouring rain since he was standing outside waiting for Kyle to get off of the bus. That morning, when Bruce had needed Mel to come help him with this tire issue, the family had done some vehicle switching. 
Melinda ended up using Megan's red car, which was in the driveway when Jeff got there. Jeff said he didn't think anything of it. Even though Megan clearly came home for the wedding that weekend, he said the first thought he assumed when he saw it was that Megan had flown to California and left the car there. And Stoltz is confused how he didn't know that Mel was driving the red car, given that he would have walked in and out of the house while he was in the driveway before and after her doctor's appointment. Well, if it doesn't concern me, I don't really care, Jeff says. When the garage door code wouldn't work, Jeff gave up pretty quickly and went straight to Applebee's. He had dinner with Bruce and then headed home. Before he left, he noticed that the red light was on in the truck again, so he put two more gallons of gas into the car from his red container. This differs greatly from Bruce's account, who said that Jeff insisted on stopping at a gas station and filling up one of his five-gallon jugs. He says he arrived just seconds after Bruce, who was in sight of him the whole time when he drove home. Jeff was the one with keys to get in. Anna had given him a pair while they were at dinner. Jeff tried all of them, and they wouldn't work. Bruce knocked, and Jeff rang the doorbell a bunch of times. And then, as soon as Kyle opened the door, Jeff set down the baby and went to turn the truck off and grab the takeaway food. Then they went over the same ground again, about how it's strange that he didn't see Mel, and when he heard Bruce yell, his first reaction was to run and find the baby. This time he adds that in the past, Kylan had been violent with the baby before, so it actually makes perfect sense that after an entire day of trying to find Mel, the thought of her wouldn't even cross his mind. At first glance, while Jeff is talking, it also seems like he keeps adjusting his sweater sleeves, but he's most likely doing the action of shaking his arm off, like he did in the first interview. He tends to sigh, adjust how he's sitting, and shake his arm, or rub his face, clear his throat, and shake his arm. This could be considered a cluster of behaviors, a tell of his lying, and a sign of his discomfort. He tends to only do these things when he's lost track of his story, when he's talking about Mel, or when he's gravitating off into details that don't matter. Nothing seemed wrong. I set the baby down, walked back out, turned the truck off, grabbed the diaper bag and everything, and walked in. You know, like we were walking back and he yelled. I ran. Were you out were you at your truck when he yelled? I was just about, you know, the brick archway. I was yeah. like right there about to turn. I was trying to rush back because I left the door open and the baby was there and it was cold and rainy out. It wasn't really rainy, rainy, it was doing the light sprinkle. <clears throat> and then uh, I moved a little bit faster. I was moving faster than, like, you know, normal walking speed. Because I heard him yell, yelled something, and I couldn't make it out. But the baby wasn't there where I left her, and I kind of went into a little... I didn't know where she was. I wanted to know where she was. I went in, I looked, saw the baby. She was uh, like just you know, one part of the chair holding over the where the tile is, the other part on the carpet kind of deal. You know, I don't know if you know what baby carries. Yeah. yeah. Well, one, so she's in... Uh Technically, she's in the, the living room, but technically, you know, half of it's hanging over the kitchen. And she was crying. I picked her up, you know, turned around, and I got a good view of all that. And he was... You got her out of the car seat? No, she was still in the car seat. She, she didn't get out of the car seat until the officers came and asked if she was okay. Oh, I thought you said you got her out. You saw the baby in the living room, and I thought you said you, you, just said you got her out. No, I, got, I picked her up. And I looked at her, and then I turned around and got a good view. I got her out of the house, if that's what you're talking about, after I realized what had happened. But we, we looked at Mel. You know, Bruce was fire So you picked, you picked her up, and then you looked, and that's when you saw Mel? That's when I re yeah. Like, you know, I looked, or, like, when I looked, I looked for the baby seat. That's what I wanted. I wanted the baby. I don't like it when Kyle moves the baby. He's hit her a few times. It's kind of scary, but... You know, I just wanted the baby. How often does Kyle move the baby? Oh, a lot, to be honest. Do you and Anna uh, yell at him? We, if he's nice to her and he just picks her up in her chair and sets her in the family room, that's fine and all. But he's a little bit jealous sometimes. And he, like he kicked her once and he, he smacked her once. Mm -hmm. But that. What, what kind of yell? What? What did you say? You, Bruce yelled, like, what did he yell? What did you hear? I just heard him, like, yell, like a scream. I couldn't make it out. I was outside. Like a scream, you know, yelling, like, not angry, but scream, like, he's scared, or? Angry? No, angry. It was loud and angry. Like, like, he yelled at Kyle. That's why I thought something was wrong with the baby when I didn't see her there. And she was crying, and I guess the scream woke her up. 
She's hard to wake up, but if you make enough noise, she will. Okay. So you uh, you came in, you kind of fast walk in there because you heard the, the scream, and then... Um, Went straight for the baby. I literally and, just, and you picked her up is when you turned around and saw... I picked her up, looked at her, and just saw that she was crying and upset, and turned. Mel's on the ground by the door. Bruce is by her head, like, you kind of crouched down, like a... You know, like Did you like? Are you saying like you picked her up like an inspector? Or so like a, like this? I went like this and I looked. I didn't see anything wrong with her. She was just really upset about something. I'm guessing the screen just woke her up. She was napping in the car. She could fall asleep just from there to Applebee's. Okay. So you looked at her and then, then what makes you turn around? I just turned around to see what the hell was going on. Okay. Bruce was screaming for him to call 911 because he couldn't find his phone. Jeff took Kyle and the baby out of the house and sat them in the truck terrified that somebody could still be in there. Then he called 911 and describes the call. Stoltz takes a minute to compare some notes. Jeff says that Kyle didn't have any blood on him. Stoltz half acknowledges as he continues to scan the paper in front of him. Jeff again breaks his focus and asks Stoltz if Melinda was shot, stabbed, or both. Of course, it's something that he won't give a yes or no on, as it would affect the integrity of the case. Stoltz says he's waiting for the medical examiner report. Jeff says he's already seen it, but he was just confused because his father shot himself a few years ago, and it wasn't anything like he'd seen before. Jeff was young, and he doesn't really know much about what happened. Something about his father accidentally slapping his gun on a bedside table and shooting himself in the cheek. Speaking of his father, Stoltz brings up his bag of guns in Jeff's car. He verifies again that the last time they went shooting was at least a month ago, but he's not a big gun guy. He just knows what his dad has taught him. It's one of the few things they do to bond together. He also always has a pocket knife on him. Nothing for bad, just for utility, Jeff sighs and crosses his arms. When he asks Jeff if there's really nobody who he can think of who would do something like this, he brings up Spaz, but Stoltz is real with him on how much of a jump that kind of behavior would be. When Stoltz tells him that it takes somebody evil to do this, Jeff breaks his glance and looks down, shrugs, crosses his arms again, and talks about how he doesn't know how anyone could do this, and rambles about Melinda. Jeff rules out any neighbor kids, he rules out Bruce's college buddy, and even says that Melinda was a pretty strong person. A great person. There's no emotion behind it, though. No sadness. No real shock. You can't think of anybody, I mean, besides the people trying to break in the house, or anything else that sticks out that we should know? And I know they were soon. fighting with uh, their one friend, but I know he's told you about him, so yeah. I really feel the need. Bruce really hates the guy. It sounds like they, I mean, I only heard half of it. I've heard more about it since. Because time. it's, you know, I would never say this to Bruce, but it was such a, a, a violent uh, scene and violent death. You know, it, it takes somebody... Um, evil, you know, to do it. So, I don't understand that, that anybody you know, that almost rules out a young 12-year-old kid from, you know, Strongsville kicking your door, so that kind of goes out, you know, but... I doubt a 12-year-old child could even do that to somebody. And Linda was, you know, she's strong, she played soccer. Right. She's yeah. kicked me in the leg before, and it hurt. Yeah. Like, you know, when we were camping, she kicked me as a joke, and it hurt, it left a mark. Yeah. Um, you know, so to think of to think of somebody who, you know, is evil enough to do it, it it's who could do something like that. I mean, anybody who knew her, I mean, she's the greatest person. Like you know, granted, you know, everyone has arguments. Everyone, me and Bruce had an argument the other day. We were cool the next day, mm-hmm. but I don't get how anyone would be able to do that. Like, yeah, you don't, you don't see that. I've never seen anything like that. It, it's rare when it's, it's, that, when it's that brutal, she's that brutally attacked. She was well-liked. She was always talking to people on Facebook. Wherever we went to dinner, there was always someone there, you know. Oh, well, hey, Melinda. Or, you know, I haven't even been a part of, not even really a part of the family that long. And, but it's, I don't know why anybody would do that. I mean, she's, she's well-loved. She's, she's friendly. She's a teacher. Everybody knows her. You know, people... And she took you in. Yeah. I mean, did she's you consider, wonderful. Did you consider her mom? Yeah, I mean, I never called her mom, but she basically was. She helped me with a lot of stuff. She, you know, she, she's great with Aurora. Aurora loves her. Sometimes we can't get Aurora to sleep. We just, you know, she'll text down. Hey, yeah. 
and it's a bring her up, and she walks up, and she's out in five minutes. She's got that magic baby touch. Grandma's, yeah. So the Aurora's going to grow up without a baby, without a grandma. When he asks Jeff what he thinks the punishment for something like this should be, Jeff says, is the death sentence, I don't know, I don't know what the punishments are, but if he was judge and jury, he'd probably go with the death sentence. One of the reasons why detectives will ask this question is because sometimes the response can give insight about a person's level of deception. An innocent person will usually have little to no difficulty casting a harsh punishment, whereas a guilty person would reflect upon the answer as if they were being asked themselves, because in reality, they are. Even how someone answers this question with tone and volume also matters. Someone being deceptive may lose interest or trail off, may decrease the volume of their response or strength of their tone by the end of the sentence. Jeff may be suggesting the harshest punishment possible, but to say the least, he lacks emotional commitment. That's not a bad thing to say, is it? He sighs. I would never be able to do that, but... And he sighs again. You know, I asked Bruce the same question, you know, as as a family, um, what would you guys as a family like to see to somebody that, if we were able to find somebody... Um, what kind of punishment do you think is appropriate? Is the death sentence? Well, is, I don't know Ohio what the punishment for it. Yeah, the Ohio has it. I don't know what the punishments are for No, murder. you know, no, I mean, I'm talking, you know, not or personally. So, yeah, what do you think would happen if you were the judge and jury? Well, if I was the judge and jury, I'd probably go death sentence, to be honest. Um, it's not right. Sure. Yeah, and I'd be allowed to go back out. Yeah, and I think that's fair enough. Um, you know, for something that's that, not to be a bad thing to say, is it? Sure. No, it's just an honest thing. You know, it's just something where kind of never be able to do that. But yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And with that, the follow-up interview is done. Jeff explains to Stoltz that Anna had told him he needed to get to the station right away, and he's visibly relieved that it's over. But further investigation would poke even more holes in Jeff's story. Melinda didn't leave the doctor's office until 3.40 p.m., and his Aunt Jeannie said Jeff didn't get there until sometime around 6, changing his entire timeline and giving him hours totally unaccounted for. On top of an already shaky alibi, his truck would be searched and the knife would be discovered. On October 31st, the police released Jeff's mugshot and announced that he was being charged with aggravated murder. During his arraignment on November 3rd, his bond was set at $1 million. He'd have two weeks until his next court appearance, which would give law enforcement more time to talk to him and build their case. Now that they finally had solid evidence that Jeff was involved in Melinda's murder, maybe he would come clean. FBI agent and polygraph specialist Lance Fragamelli was refined and patient in the art of confession post-polygraph. He was no stranger to intense cases involving heinous crimes. Nothing made him flinch, nothing made him bat a lash, and that was one of his best strengths. Even though many detectives tend to take the opposite path, it's proven that even in the art of interrogation, you catch more flies with honey. Jeffrey is now donned in the classic bright orange shade of inmates. His clothes are tight and uncomfortable on his large frame. He squints and sighs like he's just been woken up, as Lance explains that there's a few answers from his test that he'd like to go over with him. Am I allowed to look? He asks, and Lance says of course. He wants him to look and understand everything. As he turns his computer screen toward him, Jeffrey peers over at the squiggles and jolts, telling all his secrets. He seems almost childlike and curious, as the agent explains the points of issue. For example... When it comes to the question of whether or not he caused Melinda's injuries, Lance tells him that his results are through the roof, and the overall probability of Jeff being guilty of Melinda's murder, according to the polygraph results, is a whopping 99.9%. Lance closes the laptop, but Jeff continues to stare at it, while he explains to him that he's in the cautionary zone, which means Lance isn't necessarily worried that this is a serial or habitual kind of thing. It's time to talk about what Melinda did to cause a response from him like that. He's trying to set the foundation for the idea that we all make mistakes, and sure, the test has found out that Jeff might have made a big mistake, but that doesn't mean the test is saying he's a bad person. It may not even be his fault, and this will allow the suspect to feel less judged. 
But Jeff isn't going to take easily to any concept that Lance hands him. The second Lance says that he's interested in knowing if he had some sort of intentional plan in killing Melinda. That's when he sighs, turns away, and begins rubbing his eyes. Jeff doesn't want to make eye contact. He can't even face himself, let alone anyone else, about the things that he's done. And Lance is so gentle with his confrontation that it could barely be noticed by some. But he's not going to give Jeffrey any wiggle room when it comes to denying the facts anymore. Now it's about getting specific on the details. Jeff mutters things about not being good with time, that he's barely touched that knife more than twice in the last year. He doesn't understand what happened. As he has little to no emotion, you can tell he's perplexed. But he's not perplexed about why he's sitting in that chair. Jeffrey is trying his hardest to come up with a good reason as to why his timeline makes no sense, or why Melinda's DNA is all over his belongings. He's still hoping that, like every other problem in his life, this will somehow just go away. But as he sits there stewing, Lance doesn't let him stay alone with his thoughts too long. He's constantly conversational, giving him empathetic outs and reasons as to why he'd be stressed and upset lately. And when Jeff says, I would never hurt anybody intentionally, Lance knows he's got his first tell. Jeff may not be willing to meet him with the full truth just yet, but he's willing to put himself in a scenario where something wasn't intentional, and Lance can work with that. So, so for us to move forward, Let's, let's try to assess that intentional hurting. You know, I never intentionally tried to hurt her. So that still doesn't mean, you know, we all make mistakes. We all can, we all have trigger points. A lot of stress. I mean, you're getting married, you have a baby, you're living with the in-laws. She can be a little hypercritical at times. Yes, but I would never do that. Never. Well, you would never intentionally do that, right? Right. It would never hurt anybody. Right. It would never hurt anybody. Right. But it did. And and that's why I don't believe your intention was ever to hurt her. You know. But you did react. And what I'm trying to do is let's work through it together to get a better understanding. Because the evidence is the evidence. I mean the knife, the DNA, uh, the timelines, even your own family, Aunt Jenny and others, the gas station thing. You know, help. Let's 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 create a truthful timeline, the most truthful timeline that you can recall, and let's let people let's people let's let people know this. I never intentionally hurt anyone. As Jeff continues to rub his eyes with both hands repeatedly, Lance reminds him about how he's a good guy in a bad situation, wrong place, wrong time, with so many stressors in his life. And not only that, but it's time for him to think about his future. He is Anna. He has Aurora. He wants to have some sort of relationship with his daughter, doesn't he? When he tells Jeffrey that he isn't a monster, Jeff looks down, pinches his eyes closed with his thumb and finger, sighing in frustration. He wants to go back to pretending that he doesn't know what's going on, but it's too late for that now. He can't clean up the mess he's made, and it isn't going away. After 13 minutes of beating around the bush, Lance says, plain and simple, that he'd like to start at this point, that what he did to Melinda wasn't intentional. Can we start there, he asks? And a squinting Jeff quietly says, yeah. It's his very first admission. When the agent asks if he would pass a test on that question, Jeff avoids answering and starts talking about how he doesn't understand how all this could be happening. But Lance isn't here to go over what he's talked about with Stoltz. The who done it part is over and the FBI agent is skilled in staying on task and sticking to his priority, which is to get a confession, a motive, and through that, a timeline. What did she do to cause this? Lance asks him, giving him an out. There's nothing. She was fine. I don't understand. Jeff frowns and then pinches and rubs his eyes again. The agent uses loads of empathy, explaining that he just wants to know what kind of person he is. He doesn't care about what the evidence shows. What matters is whether this was a mistake or intentional. He reminds him of Anna and Aurora, but again, Jeff says he doesn't understand and also that he doesn't remember. Jeff knows that once he moves into that territory, there's no going back. But there's already no going back. The thing that Jeff isn't getting is that he can't use this sudden amnesia to argue whether or not he killed Melinda. They know that he did, and they aren't willing to play games with him about that anymore. Now it's just about why. Okay, so you okay? I went. So I don't remember 
Hang on. I don't remember hurting her. Okay. Let's let's talk about that. I don't. Okay. Have you ever experienced blackouts before? I don't know. But I don't. I mean, is is this something caused quite a large reaction? So when you say I don't remember hurting her, okay. Well. Do you, do you ever have other, remember I asked you about your mental health? Did you ever have other experiences where you just wake up and you don't know? Cause sometimes I, I do talk to people and they go, I, I just woke up and here I am naked and there was a gun and there was a knife and there was drugs and I don't know what was going on, you know? And I understand I that. Never, I never touch those knives. Those knives are just there. I never, I never touched well, them. Well, that one knife was used to, was used to stab her. The DNA is on that. I think I it, and it's your it knife. Once, but I've never used it. Right. Well, Something like this. And, and it was in your truck that you had control over. Okay? So, let's go back. Mistake, intentional. Through constant eye rubbing and pinching, the agent slowly gets different details out of him. Kyle was upstairs in his room. Melinda came home. And as Jeff was leaving, she was yelling something at Kyle. But unlike Stoltz, Lance will only allow him to wander off the path with his lies before he brings him back to the fact that they need to be talking about whether there was intention or not. And it's okay, because we all get angry, Lance tells him. The emotional background of anger, he explains to Jeff, is disrespect. We all have a line that can be crossed. And even though Jeff keeps specifying that Melinda didn't say anything to him, it's obvious that she did. Something happened between the time she got home from the doctor and when he got to his Aunt Jeannie's around six, and Lance reminds him that he's the only one with the answer. If he doesn't talk to him now, people are going to group him in with monsters and serial killers. Is that who he wants his daughter to think he is? And this is also when the agent explains to Jeff that one of his hopes is, by the end of their time together, they can write a letter to Aurora to explain what happened so he can apologize and have his side of the story out there. Because one thing is certain, Melinda wasn't in the same state as she entered the home when Jeff left, and that isn't going away. But Lance is so brilliant with his empathetic delivery that Jeff, for a moment, opens his eyes and occasionally meets his gaze. Lance suggests that it's okay if he needs to close his eyes, go back to that day, and picture it in order to remember. Jeff welcomes the chance to sit with his eyes closed and begins to slowly talk. Think about that. It just, just... Close your eyes and, and just think about it, and, and then let's work our ways back through it, okay? So, what was the situation that happened that caused the reaction? What did she say? When we talked, she was, she was just fine. She was laughing about the baby. We never really talked about anything. Mm -hmm. Well, and something... She left to the doctors. And then she came back. Okay. And then something happened. Something caused your reaction. What was that something that caused that reaction? Let's start there. Everything we talked about was like normal stuff. Mm -hmm. It was just a... Go to the anger. What caused the anger? What caused the rage? I don't, I don't remember. Do I don't know. Okay. I don't remember. I don't know. That, I remember that knife being downstairs in the bag, but I told Okay. I took it out of the truck and put it right. in the bag. Okay. And, and then ultimately, you ended up putting it back in the truck. It's all about baby steps and pulling teeth with Jeff, who's determined to take this as slowly as possible. Lance asks him questions about the bag of guns, the knife he used to hurt Melinda, and what he did that day, but it's just a lot of sighing and I don't knows, confusion, etc. Then Lance asks him what he's the most scared of, and he tells him that he's afraid of never seeing his daughter again. Jeff has been sitting with his eyes closed trying to recall that day for a good 10 minutes before he finally opens them again. He says he still doesn't know anything. Lance reminds him that he doesn't have any psychological issues and he's never had blackouts before. What do you think Anna is going to say when she hears that you don't remember? Probably call me a liar, he mumbles. After a little more empathy and pleading, Jeff finally starts to bite again. 
But before he gets in too far, he asks if he can have a minute to himself, and also if he can have an Advil. The light in the room is hurting his eyes, and in Jeff's words, his head is killing him. The officers bring him water, Advil, and eventually some food while he has some time to himself. When Lance comes back, they get to the idea of writing a letter to Aurora to explain what happened. Jeff says something about remembering that he was mad, which is one more increment closer to admittance. Let's talk about that, Lance says. Let's talk about why you were mad. Maybe you can explain that to Aurora. And Lance begins to type out a letter under the guise that it's for Jeff's daughter. It's a brilliant conduit to get Jeff talking. He may not feel called to tell Lance the truth, but he seems to have a trigger point when it comes to his daughter. It starts off with Jeff stating his love for her and her mother, and when Lance asks him if he wants to also apologize, Jeff says, Yes, I did do something bad. Jeff leans forward, covers his face with his hands, and lets out frustrated sighs. He doesn't remember much, being pissed off, throwing things into the baby bag. He almost sounds like he might be crying, but gives off no true emotion. He knows exactly what he did and why he did it, and he's hating the sound of these confessional words leaving his mouth. It doesn't matter how slow he wants to take this. Lance is great at getting an inch and going a mile with it. After nearly two hours of Jeff sighing, rubbing his eyes, saying he doesn't remember and he's confused, Lance is willing to take an approach that's slightly more challenging. Yeah, I am telling the truth. I just can't I don't. You know why that's not true? <sighs> and, and, and I'm not, I'm not being a jerk to you. Do you know why that's not true? <sighs> No. Because your psychophysiological response doesn't show that at all. I don't understand. I don't Look at this. Look at this. Number five. Did you cause any of those, any of Melinda's injuries? Look at that huge response. That's because you remember. That's the only reason you have those kind of responses. Again, look at this response. It's humongous. That's because you respond. That's because you remember. Because your body's saying, when that question was, did you cause any of Melinda's injuries, your body's going, excuse my language, oh shit, now I've got to go back and think about that horrible day, that horrible situation. And it, and in the, and in the polygraph world, what bothers a person, it stays with a person. Look at this. You get a huge response. It's not because you don't remember. You absolutely do remember. Because it was a horrific day. It was the worst day in your life. Jeff says that he would never hurt someone like that on purpose. Lance reminds him, well, that's exactly why we're here. So we can show everyone proof that it was just a mistake and it wasn't planned out. He uses this to move into shooting, stabbing, and then asks him, how do you want me to tell Aurora that it just went off? Jeff finally takes an out, agrees the murder happened, and it wasn't intentional. Lance reminds him that he can sign the letter to Aurora when he's done. Again, brilliant. It'll also qualify as a signed confession. Maybe the gun just popped. It just went off. It it went off because ultimately you pulled the trigger. You and I both know that. But if your intention was not to shoot her, I was just so mad when I grabbed the gun, it went off, and I didn't plan on shooting her. Then let her know that. Well, then I got shot. That's never going to go away. That's never going to change. Tell her the truth. Is that a fair representation? Uh, Yes. Okay. So when I got mad and I didn't intend to shoot or the gun just, it just went on. Is that, do you want me to tell, is that, is, is that how you want me to phrase it to her? I'm sorry, what? I said, is that how you want me to phrase it to Aurora? When I shot her, I didn't mean, I didn't intend to shoot her. It just went on. Probably because I was so mad and didn't realize it. Is that fair? Or it was an intentional thing. As Jeff hears what Lance has written out so far, he again gets overwhelmed. He's sealing his fate with each sentence. So Lance suggests that they take a minute to think about it, as he's got to use the little boy's room. 
Not only does Lance come across as empathetic and gentle, he's keen to use language that allows Jeff to buy into this portrayal of helplessness he's attempting to hang on to. Most of what Lance says, whether technique or not, is from the heart. He's done enough of these to understand that it takes some time for people to come to grips with the truth, to finally face the fact of who they are, who they were in those darkest moments, and admit defeat of control once and for all. When Lance returns, he enters the room with a peppier but straightforward attitude. He asks Jeff if he needs any more food or water and how his head is doing, and then he lets him know that they're not going to do any testing right now, but they will be doing more tomorrow. So in your own words, tell me about what happened with the shooting, and then we'll try to talk about the reason or the why factor, and I'm just going to listen. And Jeff, after a few deep sighs, begins to finally explain what happened when Melinda came home that day. She went downstairs and found that stuff, I'm pretty sure, or she was looking through stuff. Oh, okay. She also had uh, a piece of paper that Aurora might not have been mine for the longest time. What's that? Oh. An infidelity committed on Anna's part. Okay. Okay. Which was an iffy subject with me and Anna. Okay. She found that and the, the gun and the knife. Okay. And then what did she say? I don't remember, to be honest. Was she threatening to... So she's down in your room. She's She sees the guns. She sees the knives. She has, she sees, you said some paper. Did she have the paper, or is this paper you and Anna have? It was a paper me and Anna had. Okay. I don't know where it is, but she said she saw it. Okay. And it was on a paternity test? Yes. Okay. So are you, are you Aurora's father? Yes. Okay. But she's kind of speculating that maybe you're not. Yes. Okay. So. That's not very really Okay. No, no, that, that's great <laughs> stuff. So that goes to the why, okay? So she's... I don't remember what happened after that. I'm sorry. That's fine. Well, you know what? You did pretty well on breaks. I'll, you know, we'll talk about it some more. Uh, I'll give you you some... You need breaks. I mean, when I left the room, to just give yourself some time to to think. I can't. I don't know what's wrong with me. I can't remember it all. You know what? You are remembering. And that's sometimes how our memory works. It works slow. Jeff trails off into confusion land again, where he's suddenly at the gas station and doesn't know what happened. But Lance keeps him on track, puts him back in the kitchen, and Melinda's got the gun with her, his father's revolver. He tries to avoid the details, but they are becoming unavoidable. Jeff leans his arm on the desk and covers his eyes with his hand the entire time. He doesn't want to picture what happened. He doesn't want to look at Lance in the eye. And he doesn't want to face his fate. Melinda is, was in your room. She saw the guns. What did she say about the guns? Uh, she didn't. She just found that one. Oh, okay. But I don't even remember that one being there. I don't know. Well, you did remember it there because you just told me she found the gun that was in the room. Was there a fight about it? Was she yeah. threatening you with it? She just asked why I was there. Okay. So she asked why the gun was in the house. Maybe she's like uh, saying. Why would you have a gun in this house? Because there's a baby in the house or something like that. But what was she saying about the gun? She just asked why I was there, but that's... Okay, why there? She asked about the test and everything. And then what'd she say about the knife? Nothing. Okay, but you said she found the knife. What do you mean she found the knife? Because the knife was with the gun? Yes. Okay, okay. But I don't understand. I can't remember what happened afterwards, to be honest. Okay. So, she's in your room, she finds the gun that ultimately was used, that, that was used in the shooting. She found the knife, she found the knife because it was with the gun. She found a, a paternity test? Mm-hmm. Okay. But the paternity test shows that you're the father. Yeah. Okay. Well, obviously, and, and you are the father? Mm-hmm. Okay, good, good. So, something happened where... She went, she must have left, ran, maybe she, she must have threatened you, she must have did something because she, she was ultimately, uh, you know, injured in the back, okay? So back. What? Well, 
Did you shoot her from the front or from the back? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I know she was she was le she was found. How was she found? Face down or face up? Wait, right, but you were there. I mean, you, you found her, right? With, with Bruce. Right? Just you two, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Was she face down, meaning her face towards the, the, the floor, or was it looking up? Uh, down. Okay, okay. So my understanding are the wounds were in the back. Maybe they came from the front. I'm, I'm not. That's up to you. That's what I want to find out from you. But it sounds like she finds the gun. She gets upset. She finds the you know the knife's there. She's concerned about this paternity test, and this creates a lot of anger in you, as you said. It makes me mad, and you know maybe you. Maybe you grabbed the gun and then it went off. Is that what happened? Is that when you grabbed the gun and it went off? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, okay. And how many times do you remember shooting it? I don't remember. Okay. Jeff says that he doesn't remember anything. Even after he answers a detail, he'll say that he doesn't remember the detail. They're in the kitchen, or maybe they're downstairs. He doesn't know. And he attempts to insinuate this idea that Melinda was somehow threatening him with the gun, but even he backs down on that. He takes some crumbs from Lance, ignores others. When he's faced with undeniable authority, Jeffrey finds it easier to try and avoid the truth than outright telling a lie. He's slowly starting to understand that's not going to help him anymore. What was the reason why you grabbed the gun? and then it went off and ended up shooting her. What was the reason for that? That's what I want to understand. That's what we we need to let Aurora know. She picked it up and kind of didn't necessarily point it at me, but pointed it near me. Oh my God. It wasn't at, at me. So she was threatening you? You took she it as a- She was screaming at me. Okay. I don't know. She screamed, so she picked it up right now. That's, she, that's, I'm so so bad. Okay. So she's screaming at you. She picks up the gun, points it in your direction. What do you do? Do you grab it from her? That's where I don't understand. Oh, you got it somehow. What's that? I just reached up and grabbed it. Okay. I reached up and grabbed it. And and that's when you responded and, and it went off. So you felt threatened by her. For a minute, yes. Okay, okay. I felt uh, threatened by her, and 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 that's what made you. Is that what made you so mad? No, she was yelling. Aurora isn't yours. Aurora isn't yours. Just a million things. Okay, so she's, she's down there, she finds the paper, she sees the gun, she picks it up, points it at you. She, she pointed it like at my feet. Okay, she points the gun at your feet and she's yelling at you, Aurora isn't yours, Aurora isn't yours. Is that, is it, did I understand that right? Yes. Okay, and, it, and that's when you grab the gun and it went off? Yeah. Okay. I didn't even know it had anything in it. Right. Okay. I grabbed the gun. I think it, I, knew, I knew, I think I knew the one was loaded down there, but I didn't think it was. <sighs> it went off. I didn't think it was loaded. No, I didn't, I didn't know. Okay. It I just that one. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that one was loaded. Okay. Let me write that down, that one. And which gun was that? I don't know, I don't know. So, uh, was it the revolver or the semi-automatic? What? Was it the, a revolver or a semi-automatic? You're, you're familiar with guns, you know. No, the revolver, sorry. It was a revolver? Okay. When Lance asks Jeff about the knife, he says that's the part he doesn't understand. Lance explains that's typically something that would indicate a lot of anger, which makes sense, given that it sounds like he was afraid that Melinda was going to take Aurora away from him. 
But getting Jeff to cross this bridge is going to be difficult. It's one thing to paint a picture that he felt scared, accidentally grabbed at a gun that was somehow being pointed at him and it just went off. That still characterizes Jeff as being in the wrong place at the wrong time, a horrible mistake that he didn't mean to make. But now he has to explain why. When Melinda was already shot, he decided that the next move would be to take the knife and stab her over 35 times. Jeff doesn't want to go there. So Lance empathizes with him, explaining again that it makes sense that he would be so angry. It sounds like she's trying to destroy your family, he tells Jeff. And then he asks him, why would Melinda be so upset if the paternity test said you were the father? Did she not read it right? Jeff says he tried to tell her, but she just kept screaming no. Lance then gives him a break, because he's been responding so well to them, and also to touch base with officers who are watching the interrogation unfold. A lot has just happened in the last 20 minutes. They're finally breaking through to a motive and clearing away the nonsensical from the timeline. When he comes back, he says that the officers only have his 357 revolver, which wasn't the gun involved in the shooting. Obviously not just for evidence, but also for public safety reasons, they'd want to know where the gun is right away. At first, Jeff says it must be in the bag with the rest of them, but since this obviously isn't the case because police have the bag in their possession, he says, well, it must be downstairs then. After a few minutes, he finally says it might be in the book bag in the LeSabre. During his first interview with Stoltz, he had told a seemingly pointless story about his sister forgetting her book bag that Sunday before Melinda was murdered, and he had seemed concerned about whether or not they needed to search the LeSabre. The agent leaves the room and returns with a consent form to authorize the search. Lance circles back to the paternity test. Since this seems to obviously point towards a motive, it's significant to understand. Jeff tells him that when Anna was six months pregnant, he found out there was a good chance that he wasn't Aurora's father, who Jeff refers to as the kid. This had been a huge problem between them for some time that both of them took turns avoiding. She finally arranged the testing and paid for it on her debit card around a month ago. And apparently when Melinda found the papers, she started screaming that he shouldn't be there or be a part of Aurora's life, and that it all makes sense now. While this was happening, she was also pointing the gun at his feet. He didn't know the gun was loaded. He grabbed it, the gun went off, and after that, he just saw red. He doesn't know how many times he stabbed her. Jeff rests his arms on the desk and keeps his head down the whole time. What's the story with the knives now? Was it just a, a fit of rage, you know, in the, in the heat of the passion? I'm just going to shut up and I just want you just tell me. Yeah. So, What's that? I just kind of saw right after that. It was all... I don't really understand what it was doing. Okay. So, so... Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. I, I what? <laughs> I kind of just saw red after the first initial. Okay. After shooting her? Yes, and it just went off. Okay. Do that, I don't. Okay. Um, so, I'll put here, I, I, I saw red, um, I just went off, is that what you said? You no, know, after it just went, after it oh. went off, yeah. I, I just saw red. Okay. Red, I don't know. Okay. How many times do you think you stabbed her? I don't know. Okay. Do you think it was m more than 10? I don't know. Okay. Okay. But you do recall stabbing her? I think so, yes. Okay. And it wasn't, it wasn't a conscious thing, it was just, just in the fit of anger? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, where did where did all this take place? In the kitchen. In the kitchen? Okay. 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 Yeah, absolutely no premeditation, right? No. Okay. So all this is just about frustration because Melinda was a was yelling and screaming at you that you weren't the father. She saw the gun. Did she run upstairs with it, or no, she, she when she walked back in, she had it. I think she when she went. I think she got it before she left. 
I don't understand that part. I don't know when she went downstairs. I don't okay, so you guys were downstairs initially when she pointed the gun at you? No, we were all, the whole time we were upstairs. Oh, in the kitchen? The whole time. Oh, okay. This all happened, okay. So, initially, so she had, she so she had both the gun and the knife? Yes. Okay. The knife was sitting on the counter. Okay, had the gun, and, and, and the knife was on the counter. And did she have the gun in her hand, or was that on the counter as well? It was on the counter at first, then okay. she picked it up. Okay. Counter. And then she also had the paper, paternity paper? I don't know about that one. Okay. So she, she, the knife, you walked in, she had the gun and the knife on the counter, then she grabbed the gun in her hand? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then she was screaming at you that you weren't the father? I wasn't the father that I... A bunch of other stuff. Well, what was some of the other stuff? I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be a part of her life. It all makes sense now. Hang on, you shouldn't be here. Okay. So she's she's yelling at you uh, that you're not the father. Uh, that you are not the father. You shouldn't be here. Uh, you shouldn't be a part of her life, meaning Anna's life. Think so. Okay. Okay. Or 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 okay. And then, uh, oh, did did she mean Anna or Aurora? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Should be part of her life. And then then she picked up the gun and pointed it at your feet. Yes. Okay. 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 And that's when you disarmed her. Okay. I just reached over and grabbed her. Okay. Grab gun. And what did she do? Because you said she was, you told me you found her on the kitchen face down. So did she turn and that's when it went off? I don't know. I can't, I don't know. I don't. That's when it's all gets blurry and I don't understand. Okay. Do you remember, was she stabbed in the front of her or the back of her? Are you sure? I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I know. It's just still okay. What's that? I just don't know. Okay. <sighs> okay. Jeff is starting to grow increasingly agitated. He's sighing more frequently, and when he's not covering his eyes, he's scrunching them in what he may think comes across as sorrow or crying, but mostly comes across as disgust. He hates that he has to continue testing and questioning, that he's being forced to face the truth no matter how hard he tries to avoid it. He agrees that they should continue writing this apology letter to Aurora, which allows the agent to circle back to that moment in the kitchen when Melinda was confronting him. Jeff didn't want to deal with it, so he started packing up the baby stuff to leave for Aunt Jeannie's. He describes her as if she's hysterical, which begs the question, why was Melinda so angry and smug? Wouldn't Jeff have been more than happy to correct a sixth grade teacher on a blunder like misreading a paternity test? Often when reading a paternity test, the results will either exclude or not exclude someone as being the biological parent, as well as giving a percentage of probability. If Jeff was Aurora's father, it would say that he was not excluded and most likely give a percentage as high as 99.9. .9. Maybe that wasn't good enough for Melinda. Or was there a discrepancy in the story somewhere? And maybe as Jeff was taking Aurora to the truck, Melinda's fears that she'd texted Megan about were coming true. But in Jeff's version, he's scared, he's being attacked, he's a victim of Melinda's anger. He doesn't even know how the knife and gun got onto the kitchen counter, making them simply weapons of random opportunity than intention. Just like every other situation in his life, Jeff is determined to tell as many skewed versions of the truth as he can, so long as he can avoid full culpability. As he describes the altercation one more time, he rests his head against the wall, his eyes closed, he's monotone. Jeff is describing the moments when he killed his fiancée's mother, and he can barely keep himself awake. She came home. Was she angry when she came back from the doctors, or uh, did you guys have any bad words, or, you know, hostile words or something, or was there bickering going on? When she, when she came in, she came stopped that in. <laughs> She started saying everything about that. Wait, hang on. She came. She came in upset. Yeah. Okay. 
she, she returned from doctors upset. She was hostile towards you. Yes. What was she saying? She's like, oh, you got anything to tell me at first? You, you got anything? And I said, I don't know, no. I didn't know what she's talking about. Okay, I don't know what you're talking about. And, and after that, she said, oh, so you're not her father or whatever. And it went from there to there to there. Well, hang on, hang on. You're, you're, I can't, I don't know what they're doing, so. <laughs> so I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I say, I don't know what you're talking about. And then she says, uh, Melinda says, you're uh, not the father. Do you leave? Do you start getting angry at her? And that's when you decide to try to get out of the house? That's when I left and then I came back in to get more stuff for the baby. Because okay. I couldn't leave without any of her stuff. Okay, so I left. So you, did you take the baby and put her in the car? Yes. Okay, left house, put baby in car. And then you returned to get baby items? Yes. Okay. I returned to get baby items and that's when you when you went back into did you go back in the, is that when you saw the gun and the knife on the counter yes okay and so you went back in what did you go in the kitchen to get for the baby I had, you have to walk past through the kitchen to get to the living room okay so I had to uh, go through kitchen that's to, where we kept all the baby stuff to, it's in the living room okay kinda. living room where baby stuff is, where baby stuff is. And so when you're in the kitchen, that's when you saw the gun and counter, and that's when she started screaming at you again that you're not the father. And that's when she... Uh, and, and previously, and that's when the whole situation happened. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. 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 Lance tells Jeff that he's going to pass all of this on to the officers, and they're done for now. There's no need to finish more of the letter to Aurora. He's filled the rest in conversationally. But he'll still sign what they've come up with for now. Dear Aurora, I want you to know you're my whole world. I love Melinda just like you. I made a mistake. This mistake is not who I am. I ask you for your forgiveness. I know you don't understand right now, but as you grow, you will. I got upset by Melinda's words and actions. I would never purposely hurt Melinda like that. When I shot Melinda, I didn't realize it because I was so mad. Soon, Jeff is back in the original interrogation room with Detective Stoltz for a follow-up. But now he's also looked at crime scene photos, tested similarly again with the FBI agent, and described a little more of his timeline. He tells Stoltz that he doesn't understand what's happening, he was at the gas station, and the next thing he knows, he's being accused of murder. Stoltz offers up some empathy, telling him that he doesn't need to beat himself up over an exact timeline, they just need a general idea of what happened that day. Jeff asks if they can loosen the handcuffs for him, which they do, and they also get him a drink of water. After two hours of avoiding Lance's gaze, Stoltz asks Jeff if he can take his hands off of his face while he's talking to him. Jeff does, but keeps his eyes closed, or looks down and away from any eye contact. Since he didn't even go there in his other conversations with Stoltz, the paternity test comes up pretty quickly, and Jeff tells him the story about Melinda getting home that day and seeing the papers. When he's describing insignificant details, his gaze tends to shoot up over Stoltz's head, possibly to indicate falsifying information as he brews up more lies. When it comes to the more gritty events, he tends to rub his eyes, wanting to cover his face. No matter how he fabricates parts of the story, it always ends the same, with Melinda stabbed to death, and he knows he can't avoid that. And then she, uh, she talked about, she asked me if there was anything I needed to tell her, and I was like, what do you mean? You know, what are you talking about? Before I saw that stuff, and I guess she meant the, the paternity test that we took a month ago, maybe, maybe a little bit more than a month ago, or just under a month ago. Mm -hmm. It was downstairs, I don't know exactly where, it was kind of just floating around. Okay. It wasn't really in, like, anything, it was just, I didn't really set it in the paperwork bag or anything like that, I just tossed it down. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, she asked me if I was the 
father and everything. He said, yes, that's what the test said. Test gave her positive? You were dead? Yeah, if, you, if she asks Anna about it, she can give you the information. I don't know where we went. We went there a while ago. We, we kind of had little arguments, me and Anna, about it forever. Because I found out that she, there's a good chance she wasn't mine. She was like six months pregnant. Mm -hmm. It was way too expensive then, she said. But then after, she just never did it. She would say, oh, we'll do it this day. And then she never did it. We'll do it this day. We'll never do it. Was it, uh, was it tough when Aurora was born? Because you were sure? Was that tough on you? No. I honestly didn't really care about her at first. And as soon as I saw her, she was just great. She was yours. Yeah. It started to bother me like months down the line. Mm -hmm. After she was born. Yeah. When I started, like, you know, thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And asking Anna to do it, and she never did it, and then finally we did do it. You were asking Anna to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When the results were was great, was great father, news. Yeah. It was great. yeah. Which was great. You know, made me feel like an idiot. For questioning her? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and she was yelling at me, screaming at me about me not being the dad and everything. I don't even think she read the paper. She was yelling at you, screaming at you? Oh, you Mel was? Yeah, like her little, not like scream, scream, but like her yell and talk tone. Like, you know, oh, she just called me a dad. Everything. But she knew at that time, she knew at that time that you were the father. And then are you saying that you think she was unhappy about that? Is that what you're telling me? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Okay, but well she knew you were the dad. If she read the, I don't know if she read the paper. It confused me at first when I read it. It's because it's like there's a something chance that I'm positive or whatever. The way they did it is stupid. But Jeff, are you saying. When she set the, the gun and knife down and asked her something that you want to tell her, you don't think she, she knew the results? Or do you think that she did? I'm not sure. I don't know if okay. she did. She just okay. did. When she started seeing I wasn't the father and stuff, I said I was. Okay. You guys are in the kitchen still? Yeah, all this happened in the kitchen. Okay. And so I walked out with the baby and put her in the car. I had to go back for her stuff because I didn't think we were going to come back. And I walked in and she screamed at me some more. I just threw some stuff in the bag and walked out. And I had to walk back in for my phone and wallet. When I walked back in, I was sitting right there on the counter. I just tried to grab it and leave, but she kind of screamed and was screaming. And she said something and I turned around and I said, I am the father and Rose, my kid. Well, well, I don't know exactly what all was said, to be honest. Okay. And then uh, she picked up the little gun. I didn't even think it was... I I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Take your time. And then, uh, and she picked it up. up and grabbed it by her hand. And I was like pulling it back. You said you were pulling it back? Taking it from her? I reached up and just kind of snatched it from her. She wasn't holding it right. She wasn't holding it right? I can't hear you, Jess. She, uh, she wasn't holding it right, I'm sorry. Did she just have her hand on the handle? Mm-hmm. Okay. Nothing on the trigger? No, I don't think so. Grabbed it when I was pulling it away from her. It kind of just went off. And after that, that's where it was like, I don't really exactly understand Crime-related amnesia is more rare than the average criminal might assume. 
Even though amnesia is often related to crimes involving more passion, Jeff isn't describing accurate disassociative symptoms. What's most likely at play here is shame. It's easier for Jeff to explain away the gunshot by blaming Melinda. She picked up the gun first. She held it and threatened him. She wasn't holding it right, and it just went off. He can take partial blame, but it's mostly an accident. Jeff has no history of substance abuse, blacking out, or psychiatric disorders of any kind, which are often more present in real amnesia cases. Jeff not wanting to face the music is a constant in his personality, no matter how small or big the event. He preferred a more repressive coping style, avoiding negative feelings and uncomfortable truths that threatened his self-image. He may have come across apathetic at some times and highly defensive during others. Somehow, he remembers almost every detail that doesn't implicate him. Regardless, whether he had amnesia during those moments he killed Melinda or not, amnesia wouldn't also create fake memories of running out of gas and being helped by a stranger. As he continues to describe the fight, he tells Stoltz that he picked up some clothes and slung them over his shoulder, which could give the impression that he wasn't just planning on leaving the house for the afternoon, but maybe even longer. He told Lance that Aurora was in the truck the entire time, but now he tells Stoltz that he's not sure. He's also not sure why he continued to shoot her after the gun went off, or why he decided to switch and use the knife. To a certain degree, some of this confusion may very well be true, now that Jeff is brought to the moment where he himself has to decipher his own evil logic. He can't make heads or tails of it. Squinting and sighing under the fluorescent lights, all he feels is tired and empty. It's hard for him to physically recall the moment where he felt more rage and more hatred than he ever had in his entire life and he refuses to face those seconds when all he could hear was the thrust of a knife into flesh. Jeff, why did, uh, why did you continue to shoot her? That's a little worse. You don't understand? What do you mean by that? What is that? It's like, do you remember how many times you fired the weapon? I don't. Do you remember how many times you actually hit her, shot her? I don't, I don't. Everything, after, after it went off, everything kind of just got blurry, I think, because I can't even remember. Or I don't, don't understand at least now. What do you remember, what else, what else do you remember about the, the confrontation after you, you shot her? We're going downstairs. Do you know how Melinda died? Do you know from what? What do you remember? It's me. Yeah. But do you know what kind of injuries she sustained? Just what I read on the news, I guess. What did you use? Uh, the gun and I think the knife. And the knife. Jeff, why did you transition from the gun to the knife? I don't know. I don't understand. Was she still alive after you shot her? Did you did you feel then? Why did why did you transition to the knife? I don't know. I don't understand that part. I've never been a violent person or anything like that. I've never done anything to anybody. So you don't know why you reacted that way? I don't. Do you recall how many times you may have stabbed her? No. Do you remember where she was when you stabbed her? I mean, I know you're in the kitchen, but was she standing up? Was she sitting? Was she laying down? I don't know. Do you remember? I don't remember using the knife. You don't remember using the knife? I remember it being there, but I don't. Earlier, Jeff, you had said that you thought you put the knife in the bag, but you don't remember using it? No. I don't. But everything's all fuzzy and everything I don't understand. The detective asks him about when he put the gun in the bag, and when he decided to put the knife in his truck. Somehow, the gun ended up in his silver saber after it had already been initially searched. Jeff slips here. He wasn't even slightly prepared for this, but he's been caught in a big lie. The fact that the officers found the gun in the car means that Jeff put it in there after it had been searched and before his arrest. So he had amnesia and had completely forgotten that he'd committed a murder, but somehow kept covering his tracks. During Jeff's first interview with Stoltz, he'd been concerned about their dog Moose, who was still in the house. Now it's clear that was a guise to get back in the house and retrieve the gun. 
You know, we grabbed the black bag from the house the other day when we were there yesterday or whatever, whatever day we were there. You grabbed the, the bag with the gun in it? Yeah, but I thought it, I thought it was just my work bag at first, but thinking back on it now, I think, I don't know. And then, it's, it's Wednesday right now. Um, I know you guys were there a couple times, either on Sunday or Monday. So you think on Sunday or Monday is when you, you took the gun and put it on the saver? I think it was Tuesday. Or Tuesday. Today's Wednesday. So yesterday, do you think you did it? Before uh, you came in here? No, I think it might have been Monday. I don't know. Whatever day we got the dog cage and everything. Mm -hmm. But recently? Yeah. Um, just, just to give you a time frame, because... Um, this all happened a week and a half ago, so you just did this a couple of days ago, right? Yes. Okay. Well, that would that would make sense because, like I said, I, I won't lie to you, but um, I went through the Lone Saber, so that that makes sense. Um, I was when surprised. Did you go through the um, early. I'm sorry, not early, but uh, in the middle of last week, um, I I, uh, I was surprised that it was in there. Um, we retrieved it yesterday with your help, and we appreciate that. That's important. Um, you did the right thing. Um, but I was surprised it was in there because I've already been through it, and it wasn't in there. Um, I don't think it was in there until so the day we went and got the dog. Came. Right, and that would make sense. Stoltz asks about the burglaries and why he was doing them. Jeff doesn't want to go there because, again, having to make sense of his own antics would mean facing them first. He was terrorizing the people who loved him from right under their very noses, no doubt smug as he pressed car keys and cut alarm wires. But like everything else, Jeff says he just doesn't understand, that he never took any keys, and he swears that people were trying to break in. But Stoltz reminds him that there's no footage to back up even a single claim. The playground by their house has cameras, the neighbors have cameras, nobody else witnessed a thing besides him. And on top of it, Stoltz has been a detective on plenty of B&E cases in Strongsville. Most burglars don't break into houses in the middle of the night when everyone's home. They also usually go to the front door and even knock, or at least do a decent job of checking if anyone's there. And they don't usually take your car keys to leave your car behind, or break in just to take some spare change from the countertop. And of course, Jeff just keeps repeating that he doesn't know, that he doesn't understand. Going back to that afternoon when Melinda got home from the doctor's office, Jeff says that they were just talking at first like normal. They always did that, since he was usually there when she got home from teaching. They'd often talk about the wedding, although lately it was a point of stress. And then once the paternity stuff was out in the open, Jeff couldn't handle it. And we've talked to a lot of people. She seemed very excited about the wedding. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Were you excited about the wedding? I was, but at the same time, it was kind of iffy for the longest time. Well, iffy how? Because of the test, mm -hmm. the paternity test. Mm -hmm. So naturally, it would, you wouldn't be married. Well, I shouldn't answer for you. I'm sorry. Did, no. Would the wedding have still gone forward if, if, if you were not the father? No, that was one of the big things. It wouldn't. Have, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is that from you or that from, was from me? From you and who else knew that? Anna knew that. She Anna. wouldn't tell her parents anything. Okay. That's why she waited so long to do the test, which was freaking us out. How did Melinda find out about the paternity test? I don't know. Why, I why do you think she was questioning you? I don't know if Anna told her. I don't know. If, I'm sorry? I don't know if Anna told her. I don't know if she found a paper or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's what she was... When she came up and uh, put the gun down and the knife, and she asked if there's anything you want to tell her, what do you think she was referring to? She, she she didn't say when I said uh, I told her don't worry that it's, it's not loaded it's everything was safe downstairs it's only going to be here for a little bit and then she's like started screaming you're not the father you're not the father mm -hmm. so I, I took that as she wanted to talk about that more than the other stuff more than a gun and a knife yeah mm -hmm. when you were at the house Jeff do you remember moving things setting anything up well you know once once Melinda was dead I'm sure your mind was racing do you remember I went downstairs 
that's it. I went downstairs and I came up and I walked out. Do you remember using Melinda's phone? No. I don't think I did. I might have. I don't know. You might have? If, 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 I, if I told you about a, a certain text message, you, that would help you? Uh, sure. Do you remember texting Bruce for him to meet Melinda somewhere? No. Using her phone? Why do you say you might have used her phone? Everything was all blurry for the longest time. I couldn't still having trouble trying to figure out what happened. Mm -hmm. what's, what's not real and what's real, I guess. Yeah. As it's wrap-up time, Stoltz asks Jeff how he's feeling now, looking back at everything, if he feels better or relieved at all, or if there's anything he'd like to say to him. Jeff says that he's sick to his stomach because he's never hurt anyone before, and he mumbles that he should have just drove away. The detective reminds him that Melinda was brutally attacked, and he's curious how that happened. He challenges that it was just an accidental shooting. Jeff could have helped her, could have called the paramedics, and they wouldn't be sitting in this room right now. But when she's dead from multiple shots and multiple stab wounds, it's difficult to understand how Jeff would go from accidentally shooting her to full of such rage. He even tries to give him an out. Do you think maybe you shot her once and there was this oh shit moment and then there was just no turning back? But Jeff doesn't bite and just says he doesn't know. Like I said... You know, I don't believe that the first shot was accidental. I just want to know what's going through your head after that first shot, if, how you felt. You're not sure if it was or not. And I don't know what happened after the first shot. I, I want to know why, why you transitioned from the gun to the knife. I don't know. How many times did you stab her? I don't know that. Where was she laying? Standing? Sitting? That's everything after the first shot's like... It's almost like a dream, I guess. I don't know. Well, what's in that dream? What was the dream? What do you remember doing? I remember shooting her, but that's kind of... After that, it's kind of like... I just go upstairs. That's all. You're telling me that you remember shooting her, and then the next thing you remember is going downstairs? <sighs> yes. I don't remember stabbing her. I don't remember doing that. Except you stabbed her a lot. I remember doing that. Do you want to know how many times she was stabbed? No. No? I can't remember doing that. Do you want to know how many times she was shot? I don't want to know. You don't want to know? What would you like me to tell the family and your family? I don't know right now. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Do you feel... You, you have a lot of questions, I understand. You know, I'll answer whatever I can for you. Do you have something that you want to ask me? So that's on your mind? Besides the stopping at Gecko and the, the, the old gentleman that gave you gas? I don't know. I don't know. Stoltz makes sure there's nothing else Jeff wants to say explaining that this is probably the last time he's going to be able to sit down in a format like this and get the story out. He uses the family's need for closure to try and encourage him more, but he doesn't budge. Jeff isn't pressured by the idea of what they think of him. He knows it's useless. For the first time in his life, he can't manipulate how people see him or weasel his way out of his own mess. This is one he's going to have to live with forever. Almost a year after the murder... The state would offer a plea deal on October 12, 2018, which was rejected. There would also be a hearing about a motion filed by the defense to suppress evidence, including the tactile knife obtained by the police from his truck and his cell phone. Even though that wasn't all the prosecution had against Jeffrey, they knew those were necessary components in a solid conviction. There was also the blood on the passenger side handle, the revolver he led the police to, the GPS from his vehicle to debunk his timeline of lies, and his own given confession with the FBI agent and Detective Stoltz. Judge Pamela Barker would eventually deny the suppression, and immediately following the decision, Jeffrey would plead no contest and accept the deal. He would be guilty on all counts, aggravated murder, murder, two counts of felonious assault, tampering with evidence, making false alarms, and endangering children. This means that Jeffrey doesn't admit guilt, but basically has no defense for the charges and is handing over the sentencing to the judge. 
His defense team would use this to demonstrate that he wasn't some cold-blooded killer. By avoiding a trial, the family would also avoid having to hear the gruesome details and see the evidence of what happened to Melinda that day. They would also ask that the judge take into consideration the fact that he has no criminal history, a baby to co-parent, and how pleading no contest can get matters over as quickly as possible so that the family can be spared more unnecessary suffering. But pleading no contest also meant that Jeffrey could avoid being sued civilly. And in terms of sentencing, the prosecution would argue that this was yet another way for Jeffrey to avoid telling the truth once and for all. He was still blaming Melinda for her own murder, still playing the victim and pretending that there was no motive, no planning, no forethought, even though his credit card had been declined 14 times by the wedding venue. And before that, he orchestrated a narrative of lies involving break-ins, threats, and terror for months onto his fiancé's family, who took him in and cared for him like he was their own, right down to the literal penny. He put on a show and pretended to not know the cause of their suffering. What else would be his purpose besides twisted satisfaction? He took advantage of Kyle, knowing he could say nothing forever, leaving him alone with the corpse of his mother for hours. He ate dinner and made small talk while Bruce and Anna called Melinda, knowing full well that she was dead on the kitchen floor. And until now, Jeffrey had done anything and everything he could to avoid taking responsibility for Melinda's murder. Even pleading no contest was still an insult to the Pleskovics and what they'd been put through. If Jeffrey had any compassion for the family, now was far too late. Anna, Megan, and Bruce would share impact statements to the court, asking for the highest extent of the law be handed down for sentencing. Anna would speak first, with strength and a hint of rage suffocated and smothered, in order to maintain composure for her family members. She would not hold back, punctuating her letter with a reminder to Jeffrey that all she felt for him was emptiness. My name uh, is this is kind of addressed to you. I, I mean, um, my point is, Jeffrey Stalin should never be allowed to walk free again. The extent of his monstrous actions has forever crippled the lives of everyone he knows. My mother, Melinda, will never be coming back, and that egotistical boy had absolutely no reason or right to rip her away from us. I say boy and not man, because a man doesn't harm his loved ones. A man owns his actions and decisions without hiding behind lies. A man supports his family and would do anything for his children. Jeff has done none of these things. Because of his heinous crimes, my brother lost the best mother a child with Down syndrome could possibly have. My father lost his best friend and soulmate. My sister and I no longer have our smart, beautiful, and respectable role model mother to guide us. And my daughter, Aurora, lost her cherished granny. The worst part is that someday I will have to sit her down and explain this horrifying nightmare to her. I'll have to find a reason as to why her father chose incarceration and lies instead of his baby girl. And to be honest, I have no idea where to even begin. Jeffrey needs to never have the option to inflict this pain on another human being again because he most definitely will kill again. He is a manipulator, a pathological liar, a thief, a sociopath, and above all, a sadistic murderer. He shows no remorse and deserves to spend his days away from the innocent. Sincerely, myself, Melinda's daughter, and his ex fiance Megan would fight her way through tears, describing how much determination and inspiration had been robbed from her now that her best friend is no longer alive. Anna rubbed her sister's back and shook her head no when Megan explained that Jeffrey will never understand how they feel. He was a manipulative monster who stole and lied from the entire family the whole time they had welcomed him into their home. He took away a life that gave nothing but goodness, for reasons I'll probably never know. And Megan says that even though an extreme punishment would never bring their mother back, at least it would bring them comfort to know that someone they believe would murder again isn't free to do so. As she leaves the podium, Anna hugs her and they exchange a smile of relief. Finally, they're able to say a small piece of the pain they've been holding in for so long and hopefully see justice served. An especially tense silence would fall on the court as Bruce took the podium and attempted to recall the most horrific loss of his life. Slightly monotone, he quietly explains the toxic history of what Jeff put them through. The missing keys, the burglaries, the camera installations 
The calm of their happy family had been changed, and now the dynamic of it had been broken forever. Bruce speaks on behalf of Kyle, who often stares out the window, waiting for his mother to show up. He clears his throat and swallows his emotions as he speaks for Anna and Megan, his daughters and also his granddaughter, their friends, her students, and the community at large. The loss of Melinda is too big to be measured with words. Anna pressed her hand onto her father's back as he spoke about their dream of retirement and a simple life being ripped away from him. He spends time with their friends, leans on them to help him with his loneliness and depression. When he mentions how they do their best to remember and rehash old memories and stories about her, there's a break in Anna's face, a sorrow for her father that's palpable. Before finishing, he also lets the court know that after Melinda's death, Jeff wanted to put apps on everyone's phone to keep track of them, for safety reasons. In hindsight, he finds that terrifying. After listening to the family and taking the evidence into consideration, Barker would sentence Jeffrey Scullin Jr. to life in prison with eligibility for parole after 33 years. There would be an attempt to appeal the decision in August 2019. Jeffrey's defense would argue that he did not voluntarily waive his Miranda rights and his confession was coerced. He claimed that both the FBI agent and Stoltz used his daughter to emotionally manipulate him, as well as threatening him with the death penalty. But of course, the entire interrogation footage would prove otherwise. Not only was his confession given of free will, but Jeffrey was treated with empathy and compassion. Being given food and drink, medication for his headache, made more comfortable by loosening his handcuffs and several breaks by himself. During questioning, he was shown patience, given more time to think when he asked for it, and only made aware of the possibility of different punishments, not ever threatened with them. In fact, when Stoltz had asked Jeffrey what he thought should be done to the person who committed the crime, it was Jeffrey who initially brought up the death penalty, not Stoltz. FBI agent Fragamelli directed the court to previous cases where detectives used writing letters as a way to compile a confession of sorts. He explained that he used reflective listening skills when deciding what to write, always asking Jeff if what he was saying was a fair and accurate reflection, and reread the letter to him repeatedly. The court would find that his confession was voluntary and the appeal was denied. After 27 years in the Strongsville School District, Melinda had left a lasting impression and significant memories behind. She was a beloved member of the faculty, and her contribution left behind an undeniable void. She had been a favorite teacher to so many students who were shocked, to say the least. Until then, Strongsville just wasn't the kind of place where a sweet sixth grade teacher, a devoted mother, would just be murdered in the middle of the day for no reason. But after Jeffrey Scullin, it was, and it would never be the same. The year that Jeffrey was sentenced, Melinda would have turned 50. Instead of the epic camping trip they'd planned, the family sat down with a local news channel from Cleveland who had intimately covered the case from the start. Having time and space to process some things, as well as the legal freedom to share more, everyone reflected on what it had been like in the aftermath of Melinda's murder. Like many families, it isn't always possible for them to just up and move their entire lives after a crime. So once the cleaning was done, it was time to go back to the house and attempt to live like they did before the trauma as much as possible. But it's not the same. As the lights flash on and the cameras roll, Bruce holds his coffee cup, but it's just for habit and comfort. He's the kind of tired that doesn't go away. And he describes those first few weeks after they came back to the house, how his heart would pound when he'd get to the front door, how they had all slept together in one room every night, grief-stricken and scared. People are always curious to ask them, Did you know? Did you suspect? Does it drive you crazy looking back and thinking of Jeffrey carrying her casket out of the church? And to a certain extent, of course they knew. They knew as much as everyone else did, that he wasn't the greatest dad or the most motivated guy, that his tall tales didn't always make sense and finding direction in life just wasn't a priority for him. But murder, or even just violence, never made it onto the list of possibilities. Jeffrey Scullin Jr. couldn't have been a more unpredictable perpetrator. Sure, out of everybody, Melinda had been the most questioning and cynical of Jeff's suspicious behaviors, but besides Kyle, she'd also been the most harmless. Whether planned or not, it seems that hurting Melinda was something he'd clearly thought about beforehand. That kind of rage just doesn't appear out of nowhere. It simmers beneath the surface until it bursts through the seams. 
Bruce explains that he had asked a friend to be the extra pallbearer, but Melinda's murder and the funeral were just days apart since it took the place of the wedding, and asking last minute hadn't worked out. Megan adds that it's a slap in the face. Knowing what they know now, of course, they don't want him anywhere near her. Anna isn't on camera, but you can hear Aurora playfully yelling in the background somewhere. They don't say Jeffrey's name during the interview. They don't say Jeffrey's name in that house, ever. It's where Melinda's memories live on, and all the life she had before October 2017. And the community also does its part to keep her memory alive. Mel had been a collegiate soccer player and also super involved in the Special Olympics soccer with Kyle, so the family held a fundraiser on Kelly's Island called Mel's Cup and gave away a $1,000 scholarship in her honor. Bruce is wearing the Mel's Cup shirt from that year, the reporter points it out, but he begins to stare down at the floor as the interview winds down then doing his best to snap his eyes back up for a couple goodbye nods as the interview closes. His pain is palpable, leaving him softened and stumbling. Even after a year, he was only getting through the days one hour at a time. There were still good moments, great moments, but always punctuated with Melinda's absence and the longing to have her there with them. And Megan still coaches. She was coached by her mother growing up, not just as a daughter, but also on the field, and she likes to think of it as a way to still positively affect others with that kind-hearted spirit that her mother always had. If she couldn't grow up with her best friend by her side, the next best thing would be stepping into her shoes and following in her footsteps. Megan gets through the loss the way she got through everything else in life. The tenacity to persevere and push through is something she attributes to her mother, who always encouraged her family and her students to never give up leaving a legacy that disproves the darkness with the light and reminds you to always take another chance on yourself, to see it through, and when you can, do it with love. <laughs>